I'd send one to John too, but of course I haven't heard back from him yet. So I don't know. Well, this is a this is the conversation I would imagine is gonna would have been, would benefit from a lot of a variety of perspectives because it, I it seems like there's a variety of perspectives on it. I don't think <laughs> I don't think I could do justice to how other people feel about this. Yeah, it seems it seems it seems pretty important. Sorry, I'm I'm. Yeah, the topic, so we could just say what it is. Um, I'm like, I'm still here. I'm just trying to send a text. I don't know. I could see what Luke is. Uh, anyway, um, let me send him a, let me send him an invite really quick. Um, so the topic is basically we're looking at the scripture, right? To see, um, I'll, I'll read your text because it was, um, you said it very well. I thought you articulated it. Um, what standard of intelligibility do we think scripture can satisfy? Sometimes we defend it by using logical arguments. At other times, we say that it transcends logic and that we're not meant to bother trying. Um, yeah, so that is a problem <laughs> that we've run into quite a lot. Or I feel like that happens a lot. I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts on it? Well, uh... There's sort of a model, uh, it's a little kooky, that's built into it, right? Where um, you see that the Lord opens some people's eyes to, to understand and ears to hear and eyes to see, uh, and that it's, that it's something that, that he provides. He provides an understanding. Uh, but I think that there's a, a general ability to, to understand the, the planar speech. And I also think there's a, uh, probably a hierarchy of, of well, I don't know if that's the right word, but there's a, a scale or a, a spectrum of, of understandability in there too. Like where some parts are extremely uh, shrouded and then other parts are more plain speech and I mean you just by virtue of the different genres present in the Bible uh, that seems to be true like poetry is not as easy to understand as uh, a, a letter of instruction that's written to a church uh, when you're I don't know but when does a different part Sorry, would have I mean, no, I, I guess just different, different parts you would say that about, you would say, well, it sort of transcends our understanding. And then other parts you might say, uh, well, we can, we can discern this through logic. How do you guys approach the scriptures personally? Like, how do you read them? Can you even articulate that or no? <laughs> In my case, the the intelligibility that I expect out of it, I suspect, is different than other people who read it. Not everybody, but I look at it, and I, I look at it as primarily a history of a certain people group's understanding of God, or their ideas about God, is a better way to say it. I don't. I don't read it as something that was, let's say, injected into the minds of the writers by a deity, that it was that it was given to them by an actual deity, but it was people writing about what their culture thought about God. And when I say about God, it, Part of what I might what I mean by that is that they were trying to express ideas that was beyond the abstraction level of the language that they were using. And so oftentimes they're resorting to poetic or symbolic language to express things that uh, that, that were worth expressing, but 
they didn't, I don't think in all cases, but in some cases probably didn't have the vocabulary for it. Uh, but I, I don't, I don't expect that it is going to hold together as if it was injected into the minds of the writers by a, a deity. Uh, and, and part of the reason that I draw that conclusion is just because as I read it, it doesn't seem to me to be uh, logically coherent. It, it's, you could make an argument that it's aesthetically coherent, but that, that's not the same thing. And that, that's the primary way I read it. I don't, I don't expect that it's, I think it has cultural value, but I don't think it has cosmic value per se. That's at least where I, where I put my money. You say you don't think it has cosmic value? Is that the last thing? I don't think that it has the kind of cosmic consequences that, that a lot of people seem to feel like it has. What I mean by that is, I don't believe that if you fail to interpret it specific way or you, you don't ascertain specific facts and believe them whatever that means I don't, I don't believe that there's cosmic eternal consequences for you and the uh, Mitch used the word the, the plain way of speaking maybe you could say that in a, in a symbolic way you know or a poetic way but I don't think that's true in the literal plain speak type of way You're, the way you approach it, Craig, um, and like through com our previous conversations, all the conversations we've had has been extremely helpful for me. Um, extremely humbling. Like I have to, I have to really humble myself to the questions and suggestions that you bring to a lot of our conversations because the way I was uh, have been raised is very 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 hard line like just this is it so like which is extremely comforting though if you're in a chaotic space it's like here's this book and everything in it you can you can bet your life on like it's just like it's read it for exactly what it says and then which was extremely beneficial to me but then at the same time it's like uh pausing and humbling myself not not to necessarily cast it aside or anything but just like to approach it in a way of like, uh, like a cultural uh, philosophical discovery or something like that. Like kind of like, maybe, I don't know if that's the right way to say it. Kind of like what you're talking about. Like every culture has their stories about God. And this is the story of Israel and their God. And it's like, what, what makes this different? And what makes this special? And that I think approaching it that way has been um, uh, probably one of the most helpful things for me to even just understand reality. But I don't know about the, I would almost think it would be, I think because when I, when, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to see what you're saying where it's not logically coherent. I think I would probably agree with that because like I told Mitch before, it, it, the scripture seems to have a way of blowing up my categories because it'll say one thing. And so I'll, I'll like put it in a box in my head, like Jehovah Rapha, I'm the Lord who heals you. And so it's like, okay, God heals, God heals. And the devil comes to steal, kill and destroy. So then, but then all of a sudden you read the next verse and Jesus is like, I come as a thief in the night. And you're like, wait, what the heck's going on? Like, it doesn't seem, it seems to break down my logic and, and uh, I'm not sure why it does that but then it's, it's weird the more i study it the more it seems to god i can't even find the right language for it it like it's like it'll help me understand and break down my understanding then reformulate it into something greater like it'll take the the two my understanding and my misunderstanding and somehow interweave them into like something uh, where I'm able to take a leap of faith or something further I can't even that's not even the right language like I'm not making any sense um I don't know it's pretty interesting you know Craig and I Craig we used to have these just late night long talks about these ideas and you know what scripture was was really doing and and 
I, I've, I have fond memories of having those discussions. And at different points in my life, I have more of those discussions or less of discussions like that. Uh, uh, but I find that it's the case that, that when, um, I think it's worthwhile to deal with that, with that question. And I, I agree with Jason, like it's, it's sort of humbling and it makes you actually think about what it is that you're uh, putting your stock in and putting your faith in and uh, conforming your life to. Um, but at the same time, when I'm having less of those discussions and when my discussions are more centered uh, about engaging this as a, as a means by which to conform my life, I, it just, it, it seems to make more sense. And that might be a given because, I mean, if you have a foundation to build up from, um, then, I mean, you, you don't have that sort of chaotic space of, of wondering where I'm gonna trace everything back to. Um, and so it makes a little more sense. And, and if, if it's not a good foundation, then eventually that, that sense of ease and, and comfort and, and productivity is gonna fade away when your foundation collapses. But uh, I like when, I like more and more the conversations I'm having where it's taken for granted because I feel like uh, I'm getting somewhere and it's possible that's an illusion. And I don't think I should abandon the, you know, the, that bottom floor discussion altogether, but I, I've, in, I've enjoyed lately just engaging the text and taking for granted uh, what I believe it to be. Uh, but uh, that's just, that's just a, a side note. Uh, something that's interesting is it might be the case that, okay, I, I'm wondering, uh, Craig says, okay, I think this is aesthetically uh, coherent, but not logically. Jason said, yeah, I don't think it's logically coherent either. And that doesn't sound absurd to me when either of you say that. But uh, Jason has this line, and maybe he got it from somewhere else, that this book keeps seeming to map onto reality. And that really resonates with me. And, and one of the ways that it maps on reality is, I heard somebody say, and this would just be one small example, but they said, you know, wisdom is, is having, is being able to hold hope and despair in your head at the same time, and then and press forth with both of those contradictory things existing in there. So one of the ways that this might reflect reality is that uh, there is logical incoherence in the world, uh, or that there's, there's often, we often have to take two dialectically opposed things and 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 make them somehow work together. Uh, but I only get to that moment because I, I, ha I have already presupposed that I can draw truth claims from this book and that, and that if I see something that's opposed in it, that opposition must be serving to teach me in some way, and, and then I have to press forward and figure out how that that might teach me uh so yeah and again if it's a if it happens to be a faulty foundation eventually that all of that sense of ease and comfort and productivity are going to disappear and i'm going to find that it was a house built on the sand but i guess we all have to 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 lay a, a ground floor somewhere let me let me say something i, I think i i think i know what you're saying but you you tell me if if what I say now is faithful to what you meant. Mitch, well, you you and I, like you said, we've had conversations. The, even if this thing isn't logically coherent, it's 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 actual how do I, it's actionable, it's actualizable. It's you can use it in a pragmatic way. If you follow it, you may be acting disharmonious where you deploy one set of behavior in a certain situation, but an opposite behavior in a different situation based on text that informs you to do contradictory things. But that that outcome is, let's say at least it's adaptive. It, it's, it'll serve you about as well as anything can perhaps. So, and so one, one argument I can lay out in, in favor of this kind of reading of it or defend its, its being non-logically coherent is that 
if you look at it as, a, as this text that has to encode human behavior, you say, read this and then act, act the way it says. You get a lot of bang for your buck in terms of, for the size of it, you get a pretty sophisticated response to complicated problems. And so I think at other times, I, I've called this at other times as this idea, Mitch, you and I have talked about, uh, sometimes I call it an adaptive dipole where you have a different set of advice or different contradictory statements about the same subject. And so Jason and I talked about this really briefly yesterday and we talked about water. If someone had never been exposed to water and they say, what is it, what's it like? You might say, if it's a large body of water, it's dangerous. You might also tell them it's, it's life-giving, it's healing because it has these opposite properties, but it's not that it's not that it is both, but you have to use, you have to use both descriptions because you don't have perfect knowledge of what is under all water all the time because it's amorphous. Like this, it comes from our lack of information, right? Like you might, in, you might have instead have said of saying it's dangerous and it's fruitful. You might have said, well, it's fruitful under these specific conditions if the water is in this state or if there's these creatures in it or if you have these tools. But it's, you can compress that information and just say it's both. Know that it's both. <laughs> Um, do you feel like what I was I hearing you the right way and getting it when, when I was talking about the pragmatism of it was that in the spirit of what you were trying to say yeah that makes sense in, in response to what I said um, <sighs> yeah that makes sense how would you how would you amend it I I, I want to know how you look at it differently than than I described it. Well, I don't know if it's if it's a sense that you would prefer to, and I say a sense, but I'm not sure if it's what you're saying. Uh, a sense that you'd prefer to to sort of cherry pick throughout it uh, that would instill with me. We'd prefer to cherry pick throughout it based on like like uh, new developments in human understanding uh, in ways that we may have stacked on knowledge sufficiently that we've, that we've moved past this, or at least have, have we, we have a way to, yeah, just take some and leave some, you know. Uh, do you think that's probably, because that would be a way that we're op opposed in our thinking. Wait, you're talking about cherry picking scripture to, to make it coherent or something or make it logical? Is that what you mean by cherry picking? Well, just just that now that we've developed, we, we have more ideas about what God is or that we have more understanding about the, the world, then some of these things here are outdated and uh, that we shouldn't be uh, structuring our life around them anymore. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I misunderstand the question, but it seems like a separate issue to me. Oh, really? I, 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 was, I thought that I was saying that if we use this as a foundation for how we live our life, then that's, that's the mm -hmm. thing to do because it's the foundation. And then I thought you were saying, uh, well, um, it is because of its breadth, very pra pragmatic for us. Uh, but, but then I... I I guess I reached back into your opening statement and thought, yeah, but it's it's so old and it's and it and it demonstrates an, an evolution of thinking. And so we shouldn't stop the, the evolution of our thinking at, at the end of revelations, but should use this for what it's worth and to continue to develop uh, a foundation of our own. I see what you're saying. I if I can answer it maybe indirectly, it see those seem like two issues to me. One, okay. the one the one it sounds like you just described. It, it seems problematic to me that we have these scriptures and we don't have a way of adapting uh, adapting our 
interpretation of them in response to culture. Culture changes and it's very embarrassing because we have this text that seems uh, not in accordance with culture. And uh, it's only a problem because I, I don't think we have a consensus about what the right way to respond to that problem is. So I think that's one thing and we've definitely talked about that. But this, I think the way that I saw the beginning of this conversation going was addressing the problem that it seems like we don't have a shared understanding of how to talk about which, which parts of this thing are logically consistent or what we should expect to be logically consistent. Sometimes, sometimes when we're trying to reason about it and trying to understand it better, we're deploying this kind of deductive chain of reasoning to come to conclusions. But other times, okay. that you're, doesn't seem like it works. And we say, we're not meant you're to do hearing, that. You're hearing double standards in, in everybody's hermeneutic. It seems that way. I, I, <laughs> does, does it seem that way to you? Yeah, almost certainly. I've never met anyone who didn't have a, a double standard about the way they were reading scripture, including myself. But the idea, I guess, is to to eliminate those. But it seems that way to me. I, I'll tell you, I, 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 the reason I bring some of this stuff up is, I don't know about you, it's, it's embarrassing when you, when you believe a certain way about these things and you, you're in a position to withstand questioning and you can't. And it, I, I don't, it's not just, it's not like a, a PR issue for me personally, but it's I, the, the disharmony that I experience when I know that I, I believe something and don't know why, or I think I believe something, I say I believe something, but I don't actually, is a, it's really unpleasant. I, I would like to r remove that. And I, I, I want to make it clear, maybe this is unnecessary to say, but I'm not attacking this thing. I'm not, I think that this group of texts is the most culturally significant object maybe ever, probably ever. I think it's really important. And I think it's really important that we get our heads straight about it. And we, we do what we can to protect and preserve this thing and act the right way about it. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to undermine it in any way. Um, but I want I do want to resolve the disharmony. I think it's important because it it undermines our ability to carry this thing into the future. And maybe maybe people don't feel that way, or maybe people feel that it's going to survive with or without us. But I think it's well. I, I see what you're saying. I guess that it's predominantly done in 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 church bodies, right? That's that's where that behavior happens because you get this bit in second timothy where it's like okay so scripture is profitable for teaching which is which is a noun that means doctrine for saying i can say true things because i have scripture uh and then it's also profitable for uh reproof that is to say if someone has said something that's not true that that we've discerned was a teaching from scripture then we can say hey that's wrong for correction, which is to say, you've been operating in this thing that needed reproving, and now we need to find a way to get you back from operating about it. And then it says for training and righteousness. So now that we've got you away from the wrong direction, we've turned you in the right direction, we need to show you how to best move in that right direction. And the, the churches are doing it week in and week out, multiple times a week, like trying to, to structure their heads correctly on the around this book and then move forward in the world with it. And so we have a sense of responsibility in so far as we have to connect to a body who's committed to doing that and, um, and hold one another accountable. Does it seem like that program you described, there's these multiple deployments of this thing. Does it seem like those are compromised? If we- Like a 12 step program for scripture. <laughs> It's like infinite gesture. Well, you gotta yeah. stick to these steps. <laughs> well, does that seem compromised to you if we don't have an agreement or we don't even talk about how to resolve logical inconsistencies here? I mean, it, the problem you alluded to where there's parts of this thing that seem like they correspond, that they are intelligible or they're 
logically consistent, let's say, and others others are not. That that the the presence of that fact seems like it compromises the program you described. Which 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 compromises it? The fact that there's logical consistencies. But that's the program's point: is to to weed those logical inconsistencies. To weave them. But the program, <laughs> the program itself is described is is a part of the body that we're talking about. <laughs> the program, yeah, that's true. Well, you got to get it from somewhere, right? How did you reason that that was reasonable? I reasoned it. Well, My reason told me it was. But, well, there's a deeper thing here that maybe is beyond us. Uh, I think we're we're gonna maybe embarrass ourselves if we try to go here, but we have to. Let's get into it. Let's do it. First. There's a kind of bizarre feature of our experience. I don't know how, how quite to address this, but there are things that occur to us to be um, totally defensible. What I, what I, we can we 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 seem to think that we can do this process of deduction. We can reach conclusions by following arguments. The fact that logic exists and that we feel like it's reliable almost universally we feel like it's a reliable way of drawing conclusions is very peculiar mm -hmm. uh, it's a, yeah. this is the this is this is the part that's embarrassing is why why should it be why why should it be that way and what does that say about what does that say about us how do you how do you think about how do you think about the existence of logic and its usefulness and persuasiveness universally with respect to your religious views? I, I don't know if we should go here. This is probably gonna take it into a weird weird thing. I was talking to a girl, Sarah, I just met for the first time two days ago, and she was talking about this book she's reading. Uh, this is I'm taking a really weird way, but it's about, and she was saying there's this idea of castration where these people would castrate themselves and then like give it to basically this uh, the feminine or something. And it's the idea of, uh, so that what I was trying, and I was talking to her and I was like, what, like, what is like, why? Like, what's the, the, the idea behind this action? Like, why would someone perform this action? Because you're embodying some sort of idea or concept. And I think, what we're thinking is that it's um, it's like it doesn't seem like to me the right way to go about it, but it's almost like offering your seed to the uh, potentiality or something. Or your it seems like in that sense, I probably shouldn't use the 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 um that example of castration because it seems like you're just like kind of offering your uh, but we have stories like that, you know, like, because I think the reason she was getting it is because there's all these ancient stories, like Egyptian stories, all that sort of thing, like this idea is there. But it's like, um, so the seed is your logos, right? It's your, it's the name, it's the logic, it's, it's like when you put a seed in the ground, it contains information. It's like got a specific, a specific information in it. And then you're giving that, I think this, this is why I mean, it's like, this is why this, I think this book maps onto reality is because when we were even talking to Thomas and uh, gosh, why am I drawing a blank right now? Oh, I feel so bad. Uh, your brother-in-law, Craig, um, in at your bachelor party. Robert and Sam. Robert, yeah, Robert. And uh, we were talking about the mitochondria and all that stuff. And I'm like, this is like Noah's Ark. This is the same story. Like the logos is being in this, is in the, like the mercy seat. Like the 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 logos, the logic is there. So I don't know what I'm getting at. The logic is important. But it's like, it's almost like it becomes the light that goes into the darkness and somehow spreads more light. I'm, I'm still like speaking in some weird poetic imagery and it's not helpful at all. It's but helpful. it's like, it, it's a, uh, and so I think the whole castration thing is kind of like, it's, it's letting the, it's almost like you're killing the logos so that way you can get more. Um, I think it's kind of the same idea of like uh, what an Odin plucks out his eye. And because I like you see things clearly, right? So that it's logical. You're seeing things clearly. So he plucks out his eyes so that way he can get more wisdom. It's this weird 
I don't understand it really, but it's like, um, so that's why I feel like, I, like I'm going to put my foot in my mouth because it's like, mm. we're, we build up these little towers of intellect in our mind. And it's almost like they're just sandcastles or something. And it's like, just to destroy them. And so you can see there's a bigger world or something like that. And it doesn't necessarily feel helpful a lot of times. Cause it's like, you finally feel like you get something foundational. And then, like you said, you read, you read the scripture and you're like building up all these logic. Okay. Got this first, this first, this first way so I can do this. I can do this in righteousness. And then it's just like, um, it's like, it's not, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'm getting at per se, but it seems like this is like a, a pattern and it seems like it's even in on the DNA structural level when we were talking to at your bachelor party, which was like so fascinating to me because it seems like even this, this weird pattern uh, maps on to mm -hmm. a scientific level. And that's why, I don't know. Sorry, I, that's what you're, No, I think what you're saying is super relevant and related. I want to know why, why it would be that Odin plucking out his eye would give him more vision, or why it would be that. Because I think you're plucked. looking at the unseen. I think that's the idea. It's like you're, um, you're, like, there's the, it's this whole. I think it's the idea when I was talking about like subconscious and conscious thought, like your your eye, you're willing to sacrifice one and i'm really trying to think of another example okay so when jesus says um if you were if you were blind you would uh, what does he say it's in john like now you say we see and so your sin remains so you're sitting there saying i see i see i see clearly and you're willing to sacrifice your own your own vision in a way so that way you can see clearer so that way you can get a better, bigger broader perspective like like when I look at the scriptures, I could sit here and say, like, well, like we do in church, like Mitch is talking about, you have all these preachers and they're saying, I see it, I see it, it's this way, it's this way, it's this way. And they're all almost saying something differently, but they're not willing to like kind of pluck out their own eyes so they can see what, because they might have a piece of the truth, but they don't might, might not have all of it. And it's like, you kind of got to pluck out the one eye so that way you can almost see the unseen um, and see what's not... Um, uh it's not like clear it's not conscious thought it's not clearly defined and then you're looking you're i mean that eye is stuck in darkness now so now you have to like uh, you're pulling something out of the darkness or something i think it's the same idea of like the seed the seed falling into the ground like unless the seed falls into the ground and dies it remains yeah. alone but then it's like so the seed is the logos right mm. it's the logic it's the logic you see with your eye it's it's logical it's coherent i can see it clearly you like pluck it out and sacrifice it in a way so that way you can uh, see more. Um, okay. I think I, I mean, I'm, I'm not super familiar with the Odin story. So that's, that's my best understanding mm -hmm. of what that means for him to pluck out his eyes. So that way he can have more wisdom, but mm -hmm. I, I, I could be way off base though. I don't know. I started to check with you. Yeah. Yeah. Craig, I think God endows people with knowledge, but a little, but with logic, but it it's a limited logic, uh, and it's uh, that it's a limited logic. But it's it's weird. Like so, getting back to our first question, it's like I don't think the proper response is to say these things can never be understood or something, or to just throw our hands up. Um, at least that bothers me to do that. Um, I think there could be a proper response is to say, I, I don't know, but we should keep seeking the truth. But because um, there, I understand there's a humility, like you have to approach not any form of knowledge with humility. Because as soon as you say, I see, then you're kind of saying, I, I, I know it. Like I know it. Mm. And then, then you can't know anymore. You can't learn because you already know it. So I understand that there, there's like the sacrifice of knowledge um the sacrifice of logic but i think it's it's only to to get the greater understanding so it's not like 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 a personal example i mentioned before like the trinity thing like i my entire life in church it's like the trinity is is one of those things where every time i if you if someone asks about it it's like it's so heretical to not believe in the trinity at least in the circles i grew up and you have to believe in the trinity but then when you ask about the logic of it 
people are just like, well, it makes no sense, but you know, you just believe it. You just have faith. You just believe it. And I'm okay with that. Like, that's just how I grew up. So like, I'm, I'm like, all right, but I understand how that's extremely frustrating for people. Mm-hmm. Like even I myself, but then like, like I was telling Mitch when I finally, and it was very hard for me. Like I finally was like, okay, I, as I remember sitting in my car and I was like, I can really feel it. Something is right on the tip. Like I'm grasping at something and I know I'm going to have to just take that step and give up what I've traditionally been thought and like give up my logic, what I already know. And then if I just do that, and it wasn't even like exploring idea at that point. It was like, I'm really going to have to sacrifice this way of believing that I've had, which isn't necessarily logical. It's just kind of this. Mm-hmm. And I was like, once I, once I gave that up, I was able to see the Trinity as like a pattern. And then I'm like, okay, now the entire thing makes sense to me. Like it makes sense on every level of reality. And I'm like, but it wasn't until I, yeah, kind of like gave up my previous understanding of it, my previous logic of it to where I could understand it on a further level. I really like the way you're describing this, Jason, uh, that, that you, you sacrifice the understanding and, and know that eventually it will produce more. Uh, that's really, it's really good. That seems to be the model over and over again, right? You get this line, uh, lean out on your own understanding, right? And in all your ways, acknowledge God. At him and he will direct your paths. And so I'm forsaking the understanding that I have and trusting the the the, the guidance he gives in spite of the in spite of it maybe being logically fallacious or not expedient for me, uh, etc. Yeah, I feel like you almost oh, sorry, go ahead, Greg. No, you. Well, I was just gonna say, like, I feel like even when we start. I feel like maybe it's a pattern. The reason it's a pattern is because it might be some, I'm probably not gonna say this right, but it's kind of almost a pattern of life or something because I feel like, because I was just thinking if we do that with people, we almost deaden them or something, you know? It's like a way, logic has a way of like, uh, like I don't want to say like making it an idol, but it has a way of like, you you form a frame around your logic. So you could even do that with a person. You're like, now I know, Mm. I know. And so that when you say, now I know this person, you kind of almost deaden them or something because they, you've understood, you understand how they work, what they're going to respond is. And there's a great utility in that, but it's like, you, you can't, they almost become dead and there's no more exploration of the person once you know them completely, you know, does Mm. that make sense? If you were to do that to people, I think you would kind Mm. of, kill their essence in a way of saying i completely know this person there's no more to yeah. know about them the the way what's really what's occurring to me right now and I, i'm bringing this up because i suspect what i'm saying is incomplete but when we say that the mitch you had said that logic serves us but it's incomplete it's there's some things that it can't touch and well, this what this seems similar to is I, I hear in, in, in these circles Ian McGill, Ian McGilchrist mentioned frequently, where he, he'll talk about how almost without exception, creatures like us have these two hemispheres in our brains. We have a, a right hemisphere, which is archetypically logical. And it's very focused, it's, it's, it's logical, but it misses almost everything. It's like the fovea in our eye, whatever we're focusing on. We can see something in very high resolution, but it's very expensive. And because it's expensive and it's very focused, it misses almost everything because it can only attend to a small, a tiny fraction of what the available information. And we have another hemisphere that's associated with the let's just say the gestalt of things. It's intuitive, it's picking up things that we're not, we may not be conscious of, but it's processing more information at a lower level of resolution. And so what was, what was interesting is when, Jason, when you started to describe this story about the Odin's eye or the seed, it, it captures, it has the same, let's say highly compressed, 
low resolution character. What I mean by that is if you describe the seed, you said the seed, you know, the seed in the, in the, in the sexual reproductive sense carries information like the DNA in a cell carries information. You're, you're, you're saying that these two things, you know, like DNA and uh, like the seed, they have characters, they have qualities in common. They have a feature overlapping feature list. And so they're related in your brain. And when you see that two things are related because they have comparable features, you can make inferences about one of them based on what you know about the other one. And so that pattern, the pattern of the seed or the, um, it's the logos is what you said. The pattern of the logos, if you understand the logos, you can only, if you can understand one thing and it maps onto so much else. And I bring that up because in the, the left hemispheric way of thinking, I, I wonder if that's, when we say that there's, th there's things that the logic can't touch, we can talk logically, but we're also, we talk poetically sometimes. Anytime that we say, well, oh, that reminds me of this pattern, and we're talking about patterns, it feels like we're in that realm that isn't logical. It's it's kind of, it's just, it's archetypal, and it's, and it's patterned. Mm -hmm. it, I, I, I think I know what you're saying. In that in that left hemisphere, right, the, sorry, this, what the, I don't know which way to go, it's the camera. Um, yeah. That I think no, because the left one is logical, right? And the right one, I can't remember which one it is. But the the poetic mm -hmm. one is, I mean, it is it is quite chaotic. It is it does because I mean, even if you get into if you map that onto something like the dream mm -hmm. world or something, because I feel like when you dream, you're it's almost like a po the dreams you receive are almost some form of poetry. It's like you get things in weird archetypal images, but they're very very hard to piece together. Like even if you read the Bible, when someone has a dream, it's like, oh, how the hell do you make sense of this? Like, like I was reading Judges, and the barley bread rolls down and like rolls over a tent, and a guy has a dream, and they're like, oh, that's Gideon, and I'm like, how on earth is that Gideon? But it's, hmm. it's some like, yeah, it's like there's this logic, some sort of logic as map as being able to interact with that that uh, yeah the other hemisphere that seems. Yeah. It's like archetypal and chaotic, but it yes. is, it relates, it has a relationship with the logic. Like it, it's, it's, totally. yeah. And yeah. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's pattern recognition. You're, you're mapping, you're identifying patterns with each other. And this is, I mean, this is related to things that, let's say, Verveke will say about the scientific method, for example. There's people who criticize the scientific method and they'll say that we think that it's just it's logic from start to finish it's just a process that you can do that's all let's say mechanical but there's a step in there where you you have this plausibility step where you you have to identify what is a worthy hypothesis to draw that comes from it's not a logical process it's a it's a pattern recognition process it's intuitive and so at any step that you make a judgment that isn't logical in the scientific process, you're it's these two, it's these two processes working together. I I bring that up because I think it's I think it's I don't know what do we what do we call this process that isn't I say it's pattern recognition. There's so there's logic, there's deductive thinking, and then there's pattern thinking, but I don't have a better name for the pattern thinking. process okay so what do we call the process of the kind of the seed pattern going into the ground the pattern recognition or the seed or the logic kind of dying so that more life would... well that, that kind of thinking that you were using when you're saying when you're saying the seed is like odin's eye is like is like the is like dna you weren't using deductive thinking that wasn't that wasn't like a logical argument that you were making you were using an argument based on um, pattern recognition. Yeah. Well, is pattern recognition? Is there is there something else that we call that? Yeah, I don't I know. That's a good <clears throat> way to describe it. 
I see, I see, uh, I see two things remind me of each other, and then I, I go on to try to splice that into meaning. You know, this is maybe a, a selfish, well, a selfish thing to say because the, the, the way I model this, and I don't have a name for it besides the one I'm, I'll tell you, we talked about a, a framework of seeing where you have a, a stack of lenses. You guys are familiar with this? Mm -hmm. And let's say that each lens, like each horizontal slice of this thing is a certain game. Like you might say, this is this stack, this slice is biology. And in this slice, someplace is our understanding of an object in the game, which is the cell and genetic material. And so in this game, we talk about that, but we may play a different game. So within this slice though, within this slice, if we're gonna talk about interactions between things in this game, it's kind of lateral connection. You know, the life exists because the cell is isolated from its surroundings. It's very deductive. Like when you're working laterally inside of, when you're making uh, conclusions or you're working inside of this game of biology, it's very deductive. But what you're, what you're doing when you're connecting, let's say the DNA to like, let's say the Odin story or the, the seed story, like this is a different game it's it's a different it's a different subject is a, a way to say it hmm. you're looking through a different lens but those things this 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 the genetic seed like the dna and odin's eye they are in different games but they don't have a lateral proximity to each other they have a, a vertical proximity to each other and that that pattern recognition imagine you're looking down through the lenses through the slices and you're saying all of these ideas are related you're seeing through multiple subjects and they all have proximity to each other, but not proximity within the same subject. Yeah, I think I see. What you're <clears throat> yeah, where you, it's almost like you're, you're pulling, because I would describe it, I think, as like where you're pulling a thread through something. Um, that's the only way, that's how it feels to me when that yeah, happens. Yeah, it is, where it is it's pulling like, a thread. It's, it's like, exactly pulling a thread. Yeah, I'm like, I got well, you say here. You could... I'm drawing a thread to the, the cell structure. I'm drawing a thread to the yeah. conspiracy theory, red thread. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, so the, the, the words that I use for those, when I'm, when I'm thinking in that metaphor are lateral association and vertical association. But I... Uh, well, hold on. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're playing... You're saying that we play different games to help us understand reality yes i think so yeah uh, so like now i'm well i guess I, I'm not... I, maybe that's an imprecise way to say it we we understand reality through a, 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 a stack of games uh and i don't know if i would then describe the uh them as a stack of games um seeming to say you had to pass through one to get to the next one or, or to privilege one or the other and, well i don't um, think well, i don't think you have to pass through one i think he's saying like he uh, uh the biologist would be at this one and then not, the other person would be up here or something or or i mean you could stack them any way you want like it's not like a climbing a ladder it's just like yeah. hey i have um the way i was thinking about it earlier is this is something it's mm -hmm. going to sound weird but this is something i've like every single year I've prayed for this. Um, but it was the year, actually, I think it was right before Verona died too, but I had this weird dream. And I just remember thinking like, because I've told you guys before, like I know what it's like to be blind. Like I know what it's like to be blind in my own bitterness. And like, just, I feel like I didn't even start to see anything until like maybe four or five years ago. But anyways, back, I had this dream and I just remember waking up and I could swear it was one of those where you're like half awake. Cause I, it's like in your dream, you're waking up, but you probably really aren't. And I remember like having in my hand and my hand was like here and I just opened my eye and there's this big eyeball sitting there. And I just remember like, somehow I knew it was like God's eye. And I was like, don't let it turn red. Like, it was just like this, like foreboding, like thing in my head, just like your one responsibility is don't let it turn red. And like, and I'm like, so then I have to wake up and I'm like, God, what keeps an eye from turning red? Like, what is all, what's this nonsense? But it was almost like this precious gift. And so every year I've prayed for like, 
different eyes and it's going to sound weird but i'll be like god what happened man he just left he's not interested in my story um but uh but so i'll pray like um god give me the like just like uh I don't know, because there's, um, I'm trying to see, this is like, this is what's fascinating to me too about the weird like almond tree thing is that um, I didn't even know what it was because I started seeing almond tree after that and then come to find out it's the menorah in the scripture. Like it's kind of, a, the menorah is like when they make the menorah, it's the lamps they have, but then they put a blossom, like an almond blossom on each on each part of the lamp. And then Jesus says the lamp of the body is the eye. So like all these things are related. And so it's like the light, these lights is kind of like seeing. And there's seven eyes. Um, there's seven, seven lamps on the menorah. And then it's in scripture in the book of Revelation. It says these are the seven eyes of God. I think it says it in Zechariah. So like mm -hmm. there's all these, there's these seven eyes. That's the complete. It's not seven specific, but seven mm -hmm. as in like poetic, whatever seven means, it's the complete number of eyes. It's the complete number of lenses you're talking about. So there's so many different eyes you could look at this from. And so it's like, that's the way I guess I use it, which is similar to your way of using lenses. It's like, you're looking at it from a biological perspective, which I could say is like looking at it, I'm using one eye to look at it this way or something. And then you kind of almost have to pluck that eye out to go get another yes. one or something sometimes. But there's, cause I remember praying once here, I prayed like, uh, God, will you give me the eye, the eye of a goat? Because if you look at a goat's eye, it's like a flat pupil. And the reason mm -hmm. for that is because so it can see the horizon better. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I want to be able to do that. To just like, whatever that means poetically, spiritually, to be able to look out at a situation and be able to see like the broad perspective. And I think the reason they have that is so they can spot predators easier. Mm -hmm. uh, Sherry would know better about that than I do. But then there's like this, I was looking it up. A second ago too because i'm pretty sure that some squids in the ocean have like a wavy pupil and i don't know what the heck that's for but i'm like that looks like mm -hmm. a fun one so it's like all these collections of eyes of lenses and all these different ways of seeing and it's totally. i feel like it's like you said where somehow you can have this one eye so someone might have an eye like a goat and they see just this broad perspective others person might have like the eye we were talking about earlier that really zones in on one thing like almost like hawk vision or something and so they can really see the precision of certain things but they'll miss like the broader picture and then mm -hmm. but it's like yeah it, but they'll all map onto each other if you're actually seeing something true uh which mm -hmm. is why i think the scripture is so fascinating to me because if i i think in that way maybe maybe that's why it doesn't seem logically coherent because it's giving I mean, I don't, I don't know what the reason is, but when I get at the, I think the deeper meanings of the scripture, <clears throat> it seems to map on to how, to those different lenses or something like the ideas behind the scripture seem to actually, actually apply to reality on, on different levels, on the different lenses, like even the biological level, like we're talking about yeah. the mitochondria. Hmm. I think he I'm, said, I'm with you. Be, right, be right back. Yes. I mean that I, that's that's kind of what I mean by aesthetically aesthetic coherence. It things are related uh, related um, almost by what's the way to say this? They have features in common. They have common features, but they there, there's a thread of pattern recognition I, I mean the, 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 like I, maybe I don't know what other language to use there's there's a there's a thread of vertical associativity where you're switching games you can make a thread through it by switching games or switching metaphors mm -hmm. but but not but not by playing a single game not by playing a single using a single system of um, descriptors Yeah. So yeah, I'm not sure what to call that form of thinking either, but it seems to me like that, that's that's a very biblical form, right? Useful tool. Um what? because the Bible does uh put forth a, a number of, of games just by virtue of its of its genre. It's, uh the different genres represented. That's a good point. That's a really good point. 
the different we have to we well we have to i think craig's right because we have to we can't just play one game and expect to to understand reality well um there's probably several we should be playing Mm -hmm. but what do you mean when you say the bible does that because it, well, I was just suggesting that by virtue of having a different genres represented, it's it's encouraging us to to play different games at, at, at understanding the Lord and how He interacts with creation. Different genre, as in like part of it's kind of like historical parts, poetic parts. Is that what you mean, or no? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm. What do you mean mm-hmm. by different? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. And part of it's just like crazy. And so, to Craig's first question, trying to be consistent actually it turns out or actually it gets pretty difficult because you, well, you get the, the line about rightly dividing the word, right? Or whatever. I'm not sure that the total of what that means, but uh, yeah, I'm, maybe somewhat related to this. People use that verse to, to cherry pick the Bible and it irritates There's me no so consistency bad. in the way that they so, use this verse. Yeah. Would you tell, so would you t- I, I don't, I, I'm not with you guys. Would you bring me up? To there's speak? this, there's this verse in the Bible. It talks about, uh, and I think it's in the book of Timothy and Paul's talking to Timothy and he's like, you'll be well-trained what in the Bible. Are you looking it up? Mitch? He says, he says, right. You'll be able to rightly divide the word yeah. of truth. And the way, at least in my experience, most Christians have used this verse is to, to slice up the word. And so they'll, they'll be like, they can, they can, they can divide the word and say, we don't need this scripture because it's not logically coherent it, to my theology sort of. And Oh, yeah. divided in terms of, still useful for me it's still applicable and and actually not anymore yeah yeah they do that that's, that's weird that's considering one, the context think, that it's in that's the one thing that ticks me off that like just gets under my skin is when people do that because uh people did that all the time with the old testament is they'll say it's the it's the law it's the law so we don't need it anymore because christ came in it's the law and i'm like it's not the law it's a collection of stories you morons like it just makes me so mad and then but then i've heard people even do it with the gospels even that because they'll be like well the gospels were before the cross so if jesus says something they don't like they don't have to listen to it because it's like well this was before the cross and so it was still the law so we don't have to read the gospels the crazy thing is Two chapters later, actually, Second Timothy might be a fun one for us to read on the subject. Well, two, and I've already referenced it, but two chapters later, he's going to say all scripture is 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 useful for this, this, and this. And the all doesn't mean every; it means actually all. Are you, um, are you, sh- are you sure? Because you can divide it. Pretty sure. <laughs> I'm just giving you But a not time. 100% sure. I'm getting off topic now. I'm just going on a rant. So, but, uh, I mean, this doesn't even say divide here. It says, uh, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved as a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Correctly handle, yeah. So there's an implication here, which is, if if this is true, if we shouldn't expect this thing to be in its entirety logically consistent then it means when we're talking to people about it when we're presenting it maybe it's best to say this thing doesn't it this is not going to appeal to your to your rationality this is it appeals to your intuition and your sense of aesthetics i would well you don't want to remove rationality from it altogether that's a fair so how, point. But, uh, I'm, I'm, so this is this is a predicament. How do you keep it in, in a way that is uh, appropriate? How do you how do you well, deploy think, rationality in a way that's appropriate? Yeah, yeah. That's, some, sometimes yeah, that's it's going to it's going to shoot us in the foot big time. Sometimes, because yeah, if you get the book uh, of Revelation, we, other people we've used the word propositional. There's some places where if you if you expect it to be. Uh, propositional you're going to have a hard time and you're going to you're going to believe things that may not be appropriate i I don't know how to resolve this i don't think it is i don't think it is propositional but i don't have i'm wondering if there's a more sophisticated mechanism for deploying propositional thinking because right now i say don't i want to know what you think wait a minute uh i i'm i i missed a leap there 
Well, why aren't we deploying prepositional thinking? Because, because that has, there's sections of this thing where the multiple propositions contradict each other. And to me, that's a signal that it's not fruitful to, to think about it in a propositional way, in a deductive way. I don't think so. When we, that we don't do that, we don't forgo propositions when we come across contradictory things in life. Uh, we get we get down to the business of of grappling with them or reconciling them, etc. Right. I'm I'm with you in life. I would say that when we detect uh, when we detect an incompatible set of propositions, it's a signal that our understanding is flawed. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it doesn't it doesn't lead you to abandon propositional thinking altogether. Right. But we have. <laughs> If we have a text where it, it has coexisting propositions that contradict each other, it's a signal. I mean, in there, if we think because we can't update this thing, they're there, they will remain contradictory. Because we're not mm -hmm. going to take, we're not going to take it in real life. What we do is we take out the one, we resolve it by finding the. I don't think so. I don't think that's what we do in real life. I don't think we remove one of them as, as fallacious. I think sometimes they, they're they both somehow coexisting. They're both somehow true. And, I don't think, uh, when, it, when I'm talking specifically about the way we do science here, like the way we, the way we update our understanding about the world. If we, if we think. Oh, well, but science, science is, is, is braced in, in that logic. So when something defies the logic, you have no other course of action, but to, but to chunk one of the two contrary. Well, you find a better hypothesis. You find a better. You find a better proposition. Uh -huh. But with scripture, we have the propositions we have. We're not throwing them out, mm -hmm. and we're and we're not getting. And often in life, I'm not sure. I, same way. I'm not. I don't follow you. Yeah. Good luck on, on me coming up with an example. But it seems like sometimes in life, uh, we we see things coexisting and that's just the way it is these two things are coexisting I'm, this i'm getting nostalgic and it's making me both happy and sad and uh uh we have we have emotions that coexist but we don't i don't i don't know that we have i don't know that we see propositions that contradict and coexist and we think this isn't a problem or this isn't a signal of, of a i just thought of marriage i don't know why yeah. sorry and well in what way? <laughs> the opposites attract sort of thing. Oh. You, have, you have these things that oppose each other that coexist. <laughs> well, if, if we, if I was to tell you, if I was to make a proposition to you, make a statement, and then later on say something that's totally the opposite, it would be, uh, it would not be persuasive to you because you would, you would recognize that there's, there's a flaw in my, the, the system that I'm trying to, present to you we expect we expect Maybe. we expect things that are true if i'm going to set, a set give you a set of propositions we expect that if they're if they're plausible if they're convincing we expect that they're not going to they're going to that's what we mean by coherent is they're not going to be they're going to have integrity and they're not going to uh, conflict with one another i'm trying to think of a good example so we can explore this more i don't know why but this this is the and another thing that makes me think that we need to dig our heels in is because this isn't always a like a a Bible hop to find things like this. Like oh, it was said back here one way, and then back here it's it's something different, and you've got hundreds and hundreds of years in between these two pieces of writing. I mean, you get in John like within a chapter, Jesus saying something that appears to contradict itself, and. And uh, it's, it's like, hmm, these guys heard this, wrote it down, wrote them down right there close together. Like there's something up here. There's some, there's some sense in which what's meeting my ears is, is nonsense contradictions has, has got to cohere. Well, I agree with you. Let's bring it back to this water. And you're just saying that 
you're just saying that when that happens, that that's a signal that we don't need to approach this proposition. Uh, no, it's a, well, it's a signal that our propositions are incomplete. Like in the in the in the situation we use where we're talking about the water. If I tell you water is dangerous and like water, if I say water is entirely dangerous and water is entirely life giving, those are incomplete propositions. They're not sophisticated enough. Okay, and so the response then has to be contained if to my mind is contained in the book that's that's why you you, you you you're going through this thing and not alone uh is because you found these contradictions and you've realized that something something about it is incomplete but what i would put forth is that the part that's that can complete it is also contained here so would you say that last part again yeah i think that the the, you've deduced, okay, there's something that's missing from our proposition, but I think that's also here in, in the book. Well, I mean, I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to stay with our analogy because it's manageable. It would be as if we had a book that was telling us about water. And in, in one part, it says it's dangerous, it's completely, it's entirely dangerous and it's entirely it, it seems like you're implying that elsewhere there's a more sophisticated description of when it's dangerous and when it's yeah it's like saying it will kill you and it will save you sort of thing right yeah but I, i'm it's... suggesting it's that's that's irreconcilable yeah that uh, jason that's a perfect way to put it if it says it will kill you and it will well, save it's you. like it says it will kill you it will save you and then elsewhere it says here's what i mean by that <laughs> and you're saying that the problem is the problem is that it's coming from within the, the same. Sometimes I, I'm not convinced that every that for each of those situations, there is something that tells you how to reconcile. Yeah, the it, I am. I, I think that's the case. Yeah. Because it's just happened over and over again, right? There's been parts that I was flabbergasted by. Uh, and over time, uh, eventually, uh, it's like, oh. Well, that which was confounding now makes more sense. Uh, and it's just, a, it's a process. Is a, I don't know. What is, and that's why yeah. there's, there's such a push to engage this thing and to engage it with others who are engaging it at a similar level and, and to, to be conformed to this thing because that's where life is found. I'm not sure that those resolutions are deductive resolutions or rational resolutions. It seems to me like they're aesthetic resolutions or they're intuitive resolutions. I can deduce it by, by my experience. Um, if, haven't you had this experience, Craig, where you didn't understand something and came to understand it and found that the answers were there all along? That you just hadn't happened on them yet, or that it's sudden something suddenly clicks for you that once seemed incoherent. Surely you have. I, I don't think it's entirely. I mean, it's it's related, but I don't think it's directly related. Well, you're saying there's two contradictory things. These don't make sense together. Uh, can't you come? Can't you eventually? Mm. Okay, so I let's say let's say is a trivial example let's just say scripture says in one place that judas uh, bought a field with the money that he got from betraying jesus and he went into the field and his bowels gushed out and then elsewhere it says that he hung himself and that was how he died i don't i don't see them i don't see these two descriptions being reconciled by my experience that's a great example um the the well, explanation the i heard was quite unsatisfying for me but um well if you if you if you've already if you you've concluded where that all of this is is useful for teaching then i'm to conclude that these two contradictory accounts are somehow both useful for me uh there are two different things that i that i need in some way uh, living well in order to pull those 
two things, those two, those, that example together, uh, historically, you have to make all sorts of assumptions. Right. Um, you which have is, to, I mean, and you might not want to, you might want to play a different game. Uh, you might be saying, instead of trying to reconcile these historically, I should, I should try to understand what these two accounts are trying to teach me. Yeah, there's this, I almost brought it up earlier, um, but I don't know that it's useful. Because uh, I, I get what, uh, but I think it's related to what Craig is saying. Like, it almost seems like you shouldn't tell someone to approach this rationally or something. Because, like you're saying, Mitch, like there's, it says Judas hung himself and then another spot, his entrails fell out. And it's like, if I, if I understand what Jesus said when he spoke all things in parables, and literally everything is parabolic, uh, not just in the book, but even in reality, you can pull a parable from like anything. Like we do that. We tell stories to tell, like Craig was talking about, to tell parables or something. Well, well, that's what storytelling is kind of for. Um, then I can reconcile them or something, but it still doesn't, it still doesn't pull them together historically. And the only way I yeah. can do that is to make all these weird, uh, to, to add to scripture. Like that's the only way I can do it is to, to update it and say, okay, he bought it. He threw the money at the priest, but then they wouldn't accept it because it was blood money. So then he took it. He went and bought a field. He hung himself. He hung there for days. Eventually his body swelled and exploded and gushed out everywhere, which is how I've heard it described. And I'm like, well, that does pull them together, but man, you, we had to just write a whole bunch of stuff in there. And it's, it's Right. So if you want to interpret it historically, I think I start to kid. If you say it's inerrant and also historical, you have to do this absurd acrobatic act to, to cover your trails. Because, but you could instead, like, rather than do that, there's kind of an Occam's razor way to approach this, where you say, "Well, is it more likely that that's the case that he he did this?" insane sequence of actions or is it more likely that it's not historical and inerrant and we should read it allegorically it's, it's weird to yeah, me that okay. i were... think i start to sorry go ahead Mitch. well i think i start to catch the the heart of craig's admonition which is uh and maybe his frustration that people are dead set on just playing one game uh when it comes to um reading the scripture uh and that it might be to our advantage to, to play different ones if we want to correctly handle it and if we're going to play different ones we have to have a we have to have a an understanding of how it is that we're going to deploy different games in different situations i see what you're saying this is this is this is really worth thinking about that was a perfect example too i'm glad you brought that up that's because it's 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 almost frustrating that it's so close together you know because it's like yeah it's like almost in you're like how could the writers of these things not notice it it's like yes. intentional um and so then you have to stop and say if if i was writing something down why would it be that important if i know it's contradictory it's going to look contradictory why would it be that important that i say someone hung themselves and that their guts <laughs> spilled out like right. uh, I'm trying to somehow encompass. Uh, I want to say like, like I, I through this storytelling and using these words and creating this imagery, I'm trying to formulate some sort of idea that exists in reality that actually happens, and I'm trying to convey it in the most almost like compelling way. Like that's the only thing I can come up with is like it's. I'm going to put this in the story that this guy's guts burst out because everything that symbolizes that whole idea of someone's, their, their insides, their stomachs bursting out is what actually happened to Judas, I guess you could say in a, on a I would maybe say poetic level or something. I mean, I would like to say historical, I really would, but like, like you said, it seems like I have to do some weird form of acrobatic and maybe, which, which you can't, which I can't do, like I cannot yeah. do unless I somehow am doing some archeological dig and trace Judah's footprints around. Like there's yes. no way to actually do that. Um, unless I just say, here's my, I mean, I could just offer up 
your best understanding of it, like the explanation I got. But then, it, like I said, it still leaves me unsatisfied for some reason because yes. I, I don't know another way to explain it historically. But it's like that's, uh, yeah, I don't know. But then you even get into stuff like Revelation, where it's like, okay, how do you even ex- like how can you tell someone to approach this rationally? Like the dragons and the and the lady and the with the stars and her, it's like it has to be taken uh parabolically or poetically or something and then and then but then you actually see it historically is the weird thing like you can't see it historically but not but but, it's not you can't read it historically if you also think that it's inerrant right i think i see what you're saying like Like you have to you have to what you mean by inerrant as in reliable as in historically reliable but like faithful to the actual historical events well i mean if you if you look at history in general and the and the pretty wide uh forgiveness rate for what's accepted as history uh you, you right. certainly but can. we'd have I, I'm, I'm assuming that we're going to raise our standards of reliability if this thing was authored by the all-knowing author of creation of except that universe. we understand that it's not simply given to you as a detail as a to detail history it's it's given to you uh well there's some, there's some inconsistencies that are too plain to sure. ignore here. i don't think so <laughs> like take for example the one we said here i think it's more plausible but that doesn't it, 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 it that, that like, inconsistency doesn't um make it a historically reliable document if you only looked at this as a historical document right it, it would it would be on par or above like most historical documents in terms of its <laughs> feasibility as being accurate but that doesn't make it reliable because even if it's better than most and i'm not in a position to say if it's better than most well it depends on what you mean trying to you should say that it doesn't mean it's historically reliable because in it's era, historically is, i think it's good i don't i don't I mean, think it's, it's, it's historically don't, reliable based on on the basis of any metric that we have for saying something Thing is historically reliable right but it's not it's not good enough to say it's not so consistent and integrated with itself that it's that it i have any reason to think that it's yeah. inerrant and you might want to dodge the word altogether but if if by inerrant you instead mean that um that it it is totally good like it is totally profitable it is no totally by, true. By, ben, by inerrant i think i mean what most christian people mean which is that it's faithful to the events of history here's a question i have if it if it is inerrant to the degree you're talking about craig does it yeah. kill it does it no kill the I, scripture? I don't think it does i don't think it is it, at all you can say and this is the it, i feel like it locks you out of certain ways of looking at it but the place the place i rest is it's a partially reliable description of history, but valuable primarily as uh, and and to be read allegorically. Yeah, I mean, I think, you think I, allegorically swings too far in the other direction. I don't think. Well, the, here's the problem: we have a lot of descriptions of historical events that include miracles of the kind that we don't see, and I think that those are contenders to make it especially suspect of being not faithful to uh, the actual events of history. <clears throat> I think it that's why it leans allegorically is because it's so full of miracles and what we would consider uh, just the miracles. Very clear... Miracles don't happen today. <clears throat> pillars of fire. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we don't see seas divided. We don't see pillars of fire. We don't see, there, there's all kinds of things in this that I think or make it totally reasonable to say it leans heavily towards allegory rather than historical account. Yeah, it's, man, I don't know how to, how to approach this because it's like I, because it, it's weird because once I read it, I don't want to say first read it allegorically because that's not what I did when I approached it. I first read it historically or something. I first read it just fact mm-hmm. for fact uh, just very very hard line like I said this is what it says this is what I'm going with and um, and it almost seemed to be a flat reading and that seemed necessary for me um, but then so I don't know if you can first approach it allegorically allegorically but then once once I do approach it allegorically then like I said it seems to be historical 
uh, because you're then once you approach it in a parabolic sense or like you're talking about in terms of symbols and archetypes then it's like okay this happens all over the place because i it was you you gave me a lot of clarity on that one craig it was when we me and natalie went um, we were on the van trip and we saw you and ruthie and waco and i said something about the fire falling from heaven and it was right around all those i think george floyd riots and everything else and you're like well we're seeing it right now like we're seeing this like this is happening like and it's and that gave me clarity to see like the like when i approach the scripture as almost an allegory like it does map on so like you can get into babylon all that sort of things like the harlot babylon is lilith it's like other things and then you see like you see it happen right before your eyes all the time you see it um like the king of assyria it's like and pharaoh even it's like these characters played a part in the story and they reached a point of an archetype so they could remain in the story and then it happens all, all over like judas we when we say we use that all the time we say someone's being a judas and we don't mean they're being a literal historical judas we're like it's the betrayer he hit the archetype of the betrayer and so we use mm -hmm. him as a symbol and then <clears throat> i mean how many people get stabbed in the back all the time and they encounter judas so it's like then it happens historically all the time and then it's like once i yeah. once i read it allegorically then it's like it starts happening historically uh everywhere and like it, it maps like i like like i said before it maps onto reality um and if i read his entrails gushing out or something like and i read it allegorically then i can see it um like i can see it almost in the natural like you see it in a in a spiritual way manifesting in a natural way it's hard to it's hard to describe exactly my mom uses this example once and this is probably I don't want to do this this is gonna make people mad probably uh i'm not gonna say who's just talking about there's someone on the news and oh god everybody's gonna know what i'm talking about if i start to say it the guy seemed pretty delusional and seemed like he wasn't very coherent in his head and she used she immediately somehow her mind connected the story of um it's in the book of acts and this one king a king herod i think he kills james uh I think it's the brother i don't know if it's a brother of jesus no he kills the apostle james and then he wants to then he puts peter in prison and then he's like does something and he's like claiming he's god and everybody starts worshiping and saying like uh, this I, I don't know if it's herod i can't remember and they're saying this guy's god and then it says this angel struck him and he was eaten by worms and somehow my mom connected that to this guy that was just like totally and she's like it's like he's like it's like he's been eaten by worms or his mind's been eaten by worms that's what it reminds me of and it's like once you see it allegorically or poetically, it's like, then you can see it in the natural. Right. Um, I have a question for you guys. Uh, do you think a person is better off if they believe that fire literally rained down, the sea literally parted, or worse off if they believe it? I think, okay, I think if that's their only way of believing it, they're worse off because then they're not going to see it. Because they, they, if, if it's literal, no one's going to miss it, right? But if it's, if it's like figure if it's speaking figuratively or allegorically then i'm gonna miss it like i'm it this concerns me so much with the second coming of christ like i that's why mm. i kind of was asking the question recently like what does it mean that christ is both man and god because i think i brought up that to you mitch once or i mean you could ask yourself that craig like it, if if one of your brothers was all of a sudden jesus it's like how hard would that be to accept like, how could you recognize that? Like, and then, and so if I'm, if I'm looking for a physical clouds to part and a man to come down, I'm not going to miss it. I'll be fine. If that's literally how it happens. Great. But if it's, if it's another way, if it's like some sort of poetic reading that I'm not looking for, he could come and I could miss it. Like it says in the gospel of John, like he came to his own and they missed him because they weren't they weren't humble. They weren't willing to look in, in a certain way or, or something, you know, they weren't really somehow they didn't see God in Christ um, because they were just looking at the, uh, what, this is Jesus of Nazareth. We know where he's from. We know who this man is. We've got him all figured out. Um, so that, I don't know, that, that concerns me with the allegorical reading. I would say you're safer to read it allegorically uh poetically however you want to say it parabolically 
because I, yeah go ahead no well I, I agree with you completely I, I completely agree with you and I, I would add a lot of us I think know people in our lives who are committed to a historical reading primarily and because of that it's not it's not isolated because it changes the way that they interact with the rest of culture so for example I have people very close to me who would who are committed to a his, historical description and it leads them to a place where they have to construct pretty elaborate and radical explanations for why that historical description doesn't square with our current scientific understanding not that our is that hurting science, them? well is it let me give you an example not that the scientific descriptions are perfect or even good in, in all cases but for example it brings them to a place where they have to say for example you know archaeologists for the last 200 years are either incompetent or corrupt and that's their that's their and they wouldn't say it that way but that's their position towards like that that whole field in general it's and that's one archaeologists that's, that's, this, well <laughs> This is one example of it. If you're committed to that description, it's going to alienate you from culture in a way that it, it, I think we need to cooperate with each other. And we can't we can't distrust whole swaths of people because they're they're advancing ideas that aren't compatible with our inter, historical descriptions of fantastical events. It. Well, that's a secondary reason. I think the main reason is what Jason said. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I guess there's something, <clears throat> or I don't think you can understand this book. Uh, I said it's very hypocritical. If you've If you've not sacrificed a lot, like your logic, or if you've not humbled yourself uh, and and decided not to lean on your under on understanding, uh, but to instead, what I guess I'm trying to say is I think there's something very profound about someone who can say, yeah, like there's I've never seen a, a sea parted that. That's insane, but I'm willing to cast aside my own experience and my own understanding for uh, what the Lord has said and, and the way that he's revealed himself to us. And I, I can't quite get at the center of that yet, but it okay. just feels so necessary and I don't know. There's a childlike faith that comes with it, I think, like you, and you kind of have to do that with everything, I think. Like you're talking about you have to in order to like even beyond mm. just the bible in order to understand anything like you kind of have to sacrifice your own logic in a way uh in order to like we said before like get it or to get a greater understanding you almost because even archaeologists they could say we dug up this we dug up this uh this is how it happens and they come up with this whole story and it's like then you have another archaeologist come and it's like wait we found this and it's like then their whole story is they have to sacrifice their own understanding for it in order to include a greater understanding or something. Cause they're like this kind of country. So you can, you have to do that everywhere. But the weird thing about the Red Sea though, is like the scripture actually gives you, tries to give you, and whether you want to believe it or not, it actually tries to give you, it seems to me a materialistic understanding of it. Cause it says a great wind came in, blew all night long, and then the sea split apart and it froze. It says it That's stood true. up and it froze. It says it congealed. And I'm like, and, and I, I remember, like, I told this to my mom once. It, it was my dad was there too. And my mom, like, her only response was, like, Isn't it amazing that they didn't get cold? And, we were, and my dad were like, That's, that's your takeaway from this? <laughs> yeah, that's, just that's, the amazing, that's the amazing part. That's the miracle there is they were able to walk <laughs> through with ice on both sides, and stay warm. But even to, they're also for the, 
for the poor archaeologists out there. Uh, I think a person also has to come to the position, and this is where it gets hairy, where they say, uh, let every man be a liar and God be true. Uh, and it's not, but where it gets sad and complex is they, they discount someone as if they've been given some great knowledge, like it's a, it's a thing for them to boast in or, or they want to cast aside someone in a, not a loving spirit, but it's, it's not that, it's just, I, I'm bound by the, the revelation that the Lord has gave and I, I, I can't go any other way, like there's nowhere else for me to go. Um, the, you, you have the words of life and this all of that i i don't quite have a finger on it yet but but you don't ever get more revelation without the the death of logic right like you don't mm -hmm. like well yeah. and that's in whereas i may need to sacrifice logic and someone else may need to sacrifice their their stringent adherence to uh, a solely historical understanding of a particular passage like I, I guess we all need to be humbling ourselves before the lord and and yeah. carefully asking him for the wisdom to understand the words that he's given us and, and joining ourselves with others who are committed to the same task. I mean, all this is really good to, to be thinking about. Yeah, it's, it almost feels like it almost feels dangerous for me to say stuff like that about sacrificing logic. Cause, and it, it feels, it's very, very unsettling. Um, Cause I remember one of the most unsettling things to me was when someone pointed out, uh, I can't remember who did it either. It might, and honestly, it might've been Ben Benavides. I don't know, but it was somebody a long time ago. And they said, uh, what you need to realize is that Jesus is the word. He's the logos. That's what we call him. And he died on the, like he sacrificed himself on the cross. And I was like, that sucks. That sucks so bad for me. Cause I was just like, logos is the word. It's the truth. It's something I can stand on. It's something foundational. And then you kill it. Like, why would God, why would God kill the thing he's given me to understand or something? But it's like, uh, and it sounds terrible, but I think even in terms of understanding and in terms of greater understanding, greater revelation, greater knowledge, it's like, I think you lose imagination if you don't have that pattern. That's what I mean. It's like this pattern. That's what yeah. I, that's what I think I say when I, when I mean mercy and truth too, like you have the truth that that becomes the martyr like that's the pattern yeah. of of life giving it's like you get all the way to the top of the mountain you have the logos you have the logos there it ascends to the top of calvary and then what does it do it dies so that way yeah. there can be more life and i think that even in that's, that's yeah and i think that's gonna happen i think that's gonna be a pattern into into like the age to come or whatever too because it's like I said, I think your imagination would die if you don't sacrifice logic, then you can't imagine something greater. You know, it's like, I have it, I have it figured out now. Like, even when we talk about knowing God, it's like, if we knew God completely, then we have him figured out. And it's like, don't you want to, don't you want to know him more? He's infinite. So you kind of have to continually sacrifice your logos, let it, let it die. And, uh, you know, everybody's yeah. having to put their soul at hazard a little bit too. Uh, well, yesterday, some guys told me, I mentioned to you, Jason, I've mentioned it to you before, Craig, but they were telling me that Christ's second coming has already happened, and he's proven these prophecies to be true, and God is incarnate now on the earth. Uh, by disregarding it, or, or uh, <clears throat> concluding that that doesn't lay plumb with my understanding of of where we can draw truth claims then i, I put my soul at hazard if if i'm wrong we're always uh the stakes are high maybe well you could say they're right and they're wrong couldn't you like if he was and is and is to come according to my hermeneutic you can no, you can but say you, whatever contradictory stuff you want. Well, because if you look at it and say if they if they are being reductionist and that's their only way of seeing it, then then they are wrong to a degree. But you could say they're right to a degree because they're looking from a lens you're not looking from, like Craig is talking about. They're they're saying he's already come, um, he's already in the world. Which I mean, there's a sense that that's real, right? Like he's, I mean, he came again a second time to Paul. 
Uh, right? He revealed himself a second time. To, and then the people, like he's, or you could say people are have, still having revelations of Christ. He comes and reveals himself to them. Um, and then he manifests yeah, himself in the world things, through us. Yeah. But that's not what they're saying. And uh, there is such thing as truth. And, and then deception would be that which is lying contrary to the truth in some way. That it's, wait. So, wait, can you repeat that? Sorry. That's not what they're saying. They're saying there's, a, there's, uh, it's it's pretty detailed, but it's not what you're saying. It's, it's not pretty that detailed. Jesus appeared to Paul, and it's not that Jesus appears to us through the Holy Spirit. And, so what are they saying? We missed it. Goes. Oh, we're in the we're in the new heavens, new earth now, or something. Close. I mean, it's pretty detailed. It would totally derail our conversation. Yeah. Like, well, I'm just saying, like, come again. It's Simon <sighs> Cowell. He's acting on Earth. Yeah. It sounds, yeah, it yeah. sounds pretty specific. Well, I mean, the you best could, thing is you, you Jesus like, has come back and I, I don't have time to explain to you just that. Yeah. yeah. No, there's a, I think there's a, I don't know. Usually when I run into stuff like that, I don't always, especially if someone's being very, very hard line on certain things, I usually think uh, they're probably wrong in a lot of areas if they're not willing to, because they're only seeing, like, like I said, with one perspective and they're unwilling to look at a different perspective. But but if I pause and I'm like, well, maybe there's something, at least to some aspect of what they're saying that I could glean from, um, mm -hmm. then I would think to a degree, there's probably, uh, in what they're saying, there's probably something you could say. So I, like my, I don't know what they said, but I would gather that they probably said we're in the new heavens, the new earth right now or something like that. And then no okay well i don't know man i don't know we don't have he's to saying, he's road. saying don't i <laughs> don't mess with it don't it's don't try like <laughs> leave it alone all right you did you did mention to me that that it it, it didn't leave you with a good feeling or something so that's well that's never, because that's of this thing. particular theology that i have which says that there actually is truth and it matters which truth there is if i need to get into totally. that door to save my life i have to have the the right key to do it totally. it, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's tough for every is that... sorry Lori's taping stuff it doesn't matter if oh. it sucks that nobody has the right key uh i mean it doesn't matter like if the situation is bad or if the outcome is bad because the case the facts are i actually needed that key to get in and if i had the wrong key i didn't get in and if i didn't get in i was iced uh, yeah it kills your hope yeah I, that's and why not, I, and not in the red sea kind of way no <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's it's a terrible thing that well that the I think there's only one door and that and that's uncomfortable. That is the bitch of it is you have to like a lot of people think there's but we just we just kind of all agreed that what that door is because we said it's the oh. the pattern, right? I mean didn't well, we say that? I, like I, I don't think Mitch no. thinks so. Oh, okay. I don't have a pattern in mind when I say no. that there's only one door. But that's yeah. Because to me, that's what Christ is, and you, and we're called to pick up our cross and follow Him, and so it is the that's what that's the pattern of life. And, Christ does and, offer a pattern, and we are to follow it. Uh huh. And it's a we narrow way. Agree. It is a very narrow way because it brought it's so much easier to to not uh, to choose myself rather than or uh, you know than to choose another person. The the the. The way of humility is extremely, oh gosh, it's, it, 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 that's what I mean. When you get into things with, with Christ and like what, and things about what like humility and love, it's like they're, they take these paradoxes and, or, or these two opposites. That's what they do. It's like humility is like the, this narrow way, but it's like the broadest path at the same time or something. It's like, like if you actually take the way of humility, it seems you have to narrow yourself. I guess, but then your whole world gets gets broader. Your your uh, your hope, your sphere, your your knowledge, everything just like opens up. Your world opens up, but it's like what you have to do to yourself feels like this. It's almost like squishing or crushing of yourself or something. And and uh, and it seems that's I guess that's what I mean. Where it is like the the pattern, and no one no one comes to God except through Christ. Except through that that same pattern would be the that's the that's the door to life or something like that maybe that's that's probably heretical i don't know <laughs> it sounds right 
<laughs> this is your catchphrase at this point, Jason. Your catchphrase is that's probably heretical. I don't know. I know. I know. There's this guy I picked up a book at McKay's randomly. I didn't even know who he was. And it was uh, Khalil uh, Gibran or something. I'm probably not saying that right. But one of his books is called like Khalil the Heretic or something. And I was just like, and this was right around the time I was like exploring all these different ideas, trying to gain some understanding. And I was like, man, I feel like I'm just being a complete total heretic. So I just, I started calling myself mm. that because I was just like, <laughs> if I call myself that, then I'll beat him to the punch. And then it's just like, oh, Jason's just the heretic. All right. Oh, that, that, claim. <laughs> that means don't trust anything you say. But that I mean, what? we're probably all heretical. I mean, it's inevitable that we're going to, we're going to miss the truth along the while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as you're not the damnable heretic, right? That's the one you want to avoid. Or are you going to say? As long, as long as my key fits in those, those pearly gates. Uh, nice. Okay. Yeah. So do we even like come to a conclusion on how to understand this book? <laughs> well, we, I, we gained some ground. I, I really think what Craig's saying is... is I think it, we made progress. It's totally right that you have to correctly handle this word of truth. And uh, you... It, that, that isn't just done by playing one game or, one, or using one particular lens. I think that's true. But uh, as to how, uh, when, and where, and how, uh, that gets trickier. Do you but think I, you, I, I, yeah. Do you Go meet ahead. somebody, you hand them the book, you say, this isn't, this isn't a, what do you say to them? If they had never read it before, I think they're almost better you say, off. You say, nothing in this book happened. I'm just kidding. You say, things in this book might have happened. Read it as an allegory. What do you? What do you? I mean, what do you say to these people? Because we're all we're all we're all in this position because we we all defend this thing in some man in some. Know. Well, you say read it. You, 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 <laughs> you say, say read, read it. Read it and pray. Read it and yeah. pray a lot. <laughs> That's where I get kind of kooky about it, and I think the prayer is you can't do it without it, and then I think that you can't do it without. Uh, Christian community, uh, but that's all sort of trite. You say you hand it to him. You say the Earth is six thousand years old. The Earth is flat. They're yeah, going to be don't fine. Don't say that. For sure. I, think, I honestly think they're fine with, if, if, in thinking that, and sometimes I, I think they're better off. I mean, the archaeologists are going to get the brunt of it, but so dinosaurs <laughs> never existed. Who knows in archaeology? Literally nobody. I don't. Uh, dragons, has ever I, met an archaeologist in there. Dragons, not dinosaurs, right? Dragons all the way. <laughs> we don't have a mythology of dinosaurs, but every mythology has dragons. Come on. <laughs> all right, rapid fire, uh, Mitch. What do you think about dinosaurs? Did they exist? When did they exist? I don't know. This is the question. I'm agnostic about dinosaurs. <laughs> what'd, you, what'd you say? I'm agnostic about dinosaurs. This is what this is what most people say. As they say, uh, next question, please. Really? That's Who cares? Well, yeah, I had a girl ask me that once, and I knew I knew the heart of her question was was the six thousand, the literal six day creation. And I'm like, you cannot actually read scriptures, and well, you can't. I shouldn't say you can't, because um, you can, because there's plenty of Christians that read scriptures and hold to that. But I'm like, if you're actually looking at it, what we judge time on what we call a day doesn't actually happen until like the fourth day and i'm like so what were these things before that like what are these days <laughs> the thing is that that's not ever when i when i hear a person that's that's getting kind of one lane about something like that i don't ever think well i need to take down this whole like position real quick because that's going to be problematic for them i yeah. there's probably something uh, at the center of their desire to to cling to something like that that's that's more in need of addressing so like, I, I, <laughs> this is a big problem though i mean this is there's people walking in the building and they say i think i'm interested in this and they say but what do you guys think about the dinosaurs and they're like we don't want to talk about that <laughs> they'll be like okay i'm 
I'll take my business elsewhere. I think it's a problem. Why? I think it's a problem because it's a this massive problematic element elephant in the room that if we get if we just don't talk about it, it's just it's so suspicious, and it signals that this thing doesn't have a way of dealing with. If someone doesn't want to talk about dinosaurs, you you question them as as a, as a person. What I'm saying is this this, this worldview. If 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 we haven't if we haven't had some kind of consensus about something like the presence of dinosaurs, like the existence of dinosaurs, like some of us think they existed, some of us don't. I think <laughs> I think we've got a problem on our hands. What's the problem? <laughs> is the problem? That some of us think one thing and some of us think another about dinosaurs. The, the church the, isn't really in the business of addressing dinosaurs. Eh? Could the problem be that that is the problem more that teachers don't want to address it? Because if it's a if it's like a common person and they said, oh, I don't know, or I don't really care, well, or the, I don't the, want to address the, it. The, the problem, the, the, the on problem within the church, you know, X. I y. love how we're talking but, about dinosaurs right now. Actually, this is the, amazing. The, the, the problem, the problem is that we think that it doesn't matter. I Why really want to get not not we can't we we can't focus on every single thing you know different people are focusing on different things like why does why is that a problem if we think it doesn't matter because dinosaurs are because awesome. the, the, the claim is that there's this complete worldview that's, worldview doesn't that's include consistent every, that's consistent and coherent in the world i would think it, our answer to this question is probably somewhere in calvin and Hobbes. just throwing that out there because <laughs> dinosaurs that. are really cool why? and why? for why? that reason they they obviously were real just for that reason alone why does it matter if if that doesn't matter wait what why does it because none, none of us none, no one person can focus on every aspect of reality no i think i think what's maybe well i don't know that I've, i don't know that i've necessarily encountered people saying we don't want to talk about it i think in a way when they're saying they don't want to tell cows here now at this point <laughs> talking about dinosaurs <laughs> should let them in <laughs> yeah let them in all right but i think the reason is it's more like they're saying the reason we're not going to talk about it is because we know they don't exist like we're the teachers and we know they don't exist hey cow cow what do you think about dinosaurs you're, not the, we're, you're, we, everything. you're the teachers of you just not the pieces of everything. You can't focus on everything. Mm, um, I didn't catch Unity all. Unity is that. never claiming okay. evidence. I'll about. try. To, I'll try to get you up. We went through a lot about like how to approach the Bible and Scripture, and when, how to understand it, and how that, uh, how you, <clears throat> under, when you're trying to understand logically, like in order to get more understanding, you kind of have to let the logic die and all that stuff. So we went through all of that, and now somehow we ended up on dinosaurs, and we're talking about dinosaurs now, and. Okay, is, um, the to, answer, to, answer, to, answer, to answer Craig, the, the dinosaur bones were buried in the ground by Satan to test our faith. Um, but the earth is 6,000 years old. So that's that's my take on dinosaurs. <laughs> that's buried just like ground. your opinion, man. Yeah, well, it's the young earth creationism where like before <laughs> sin and death entered the world, the T-Rexes, they ate uh, watermelons. And um, you know, you can see all this and more at Ken Ham's life-size arc museum. I've been to that actually. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. I'm pretty sure there were dinosaurs on the ark if I remember right. I mean, I it's know. like if, if they were gonna put if they were gonna just like breed all future species from just two animals, God would have to do a miracle to prevent them from being inbred. But if he was going to do miracles for that, why doesn't he just like do miracles to like, you know, shrink them down so that they can fit more animals on a smaller boat? The miracle of shrinking the animals. He's, he's just going to do like as few miracles as possible, kind of. <laughs> the, the, the problem, the, the reason it came up, I, it, it's hard to talk seriously about this, but it is, my, sorry. My, my, my feeling is, if if our if our 
stance on this is the the Canaham watermelon hypothesis. My feel it it seems like this just totally incinerates our credibility as a community, and that strikes me as a problem. And maybe people don't agree it's a problem. Craig, did you say that you are a a Christian or you're kind of more kind of agnostic or? Well, different people have different measuring criteria. I say I am. You say you are Christian. Yes. I say if you say you're Christian and you and you sort of you're following Jesus as your ultimate moral example, that means you're Christian as far as my two cents go. That's um, I would say yes to that. Okay, I got you. So okay, so you're talking you are speaking from a place of concern for the credibility of of the brand of, of Christianity um Inc. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean certainly uh, I mean, the thing is, a lot of science is based on these kinds of assumptions that I don't know if we can be 100% on all of them, but yeah, it looks to me like, you know, life arose through evolution. So, I mean, and if people are kind of going to deny that, I mean, you know, the way I, I think about it is like the reason why they are very firm on this kind of literal, literalist um, inerrancy of the Bible is that for them, if the Bible isn't that, there's no reason why god exists so the reason why god exists is that the book is perfect and because god exists he gave us a perfect book because their conception of god is like their highest conception of god is often just power so they're always emphasizing the power of god the sovereignty of god but um you know george mcdonald said that uh, mere lonely power has no power to create and love is the power of power so it's kind of like the god of love almost in, in dueling in dueling christianity so you got your you got your conservative christianities or christianity or the pharisees and you got your uh super left-wing christianity which is like almost your sadducees that deny the resurrection because like sherry says you go too far right you cease to love your neighbor you create burdens for them that you yourself do not bear and go too far left you cease to love god i don't know why it is like that but it's like on the one hand you have constraint on the other side you have freedom jason turns on one side you have truth and the other side you have mercy and um so it's kind of a i don't know maybe it's a mystical Tao type thing but where the Tao is christ type thing i don't know yeah i'm curious we were talking earlier about errancy i wonder if you say more about how you think about the book as perfect or imperfect i have almost no thoughts on that you know like in other words the book is continually blowing apart my categories as jason likes to say um you know i don't understand i don't know how to think about scripture i know nothing about scripture i don't i don't do the grammatical historical method of figuring out the author's intent and figuring out the historical context and understanding the grammar of the ancient languages i don't do that very well I do that almost not at all I'm mostly reading scripture in this kind of idiosyncratic way. And um, I would almost despair, except that I think because it is inspired, it means more than the mm. author's meant. So I, I, I think that, but, um, <clears throat> you know, it's got to be the spirit of the law. You know, it's like, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, right? Lo love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's this, you know, it's like, um, so it's, the scripture's got to read out like that. It's got to match that. But aside from that, I don't really have too many ideas. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, all I know is scripture is really old. It's really, really old. It comes from a different time where people had just like way more brutal realities and mm. um, ideals and things like that. It's kind of amazing that scripture is as broad-minded and inclusive as it is. I listened to your, your, you had a recent podcast, I think it's recent, where you talked about revelation with respect to the word propositional. What was the, what's the predicament that set up that, that conversation or that podcast episode? Okay. Um, I was thinking about how, um, you know, in, in, in logic, propositional logic, you have this structure, if P, then Q something like that i mean at least in the 
Yeah, I mean, you, you, have, you have, if P then Q, you have a conditional statement. And so that there's the antecedent, which is P, and there's the consequent Q. And I was thinking about how a kind of, um, let's say, biblical universalism that tries to um, fit the universalism of scripture into nice, tidy categories, it is so often in the business of trying to deny the antecedent. Some fundamentalist guy will say, look, the Bible teaches eternal hell, eternal hell, that's P. Therefore, take it seriously. Take hell seriously. Or take the Bible seriously where it says that. That's your cue. And your propositional universalist type guy, the one who thinks he can kind of map it out and systemize it, which, you know, it's like, thou art the man, that's me. But um, they're going to deny the antecedent and say, well, almost like, what, like the serpent? Has God really said? But it's, it's, it's um, uh, yeah. You know, Gehenna is a, that's a socio political commentary type thing. It's a metaphor based on a geographic location. Jesus wasn't really talking about some metaphysical place where, you know, there's literally a worm that literally doesn't die and things like that. And then kind of a more mystical universalism, which seeks to understand the sense in which hell might be eternal and forever but also end because god's love is yet more ultimate would say no there is eternal hell but perhaps we misunderstand the nature of eternity when we imagine hell to just be something like you know the eternity of hell to be something like indefinite extension along the space-time continuum what if it's something different than that what if it is something more in the chaotic reflexive um um dialectical crazy uh nature of of the present moment itself but somehow you know it's like i don't have the words for it right now last Try question to say it in the episode last, last question when you say reflexive you use some some adjectives when you say reflect do you mean that in the ian mcgilchrist way where he's talking about left brain Oh, is the left brain the reflexive hemisphere? I'm not sure I do, if only because I don't know exactly do you feel, what he means there. I, I tried to bring Ian McGilchrist into this earlier, and I think I was probably totally <clears throat> inappropriate in doing so. Well, he's kind of awesome. He kind of does apply everywhere, so I don't know. What, what, what were you thinking? Oh, you mean just now? Yes. McGilchrist, well, you know, I'm a little bit familiar with him, but, um, uh, you know, Luke was saying how basically the kind of what it's interesting because um, I've, I've kind of operated professionally in similar spheres as McGilchrist, but not to the same extent, talking about people who have suffered strokes, CBAs. Um, and the, the difference is that you see when it's on the left side versus the right side. And um, right side strokes tend to result in problems with attention and impulse control. Um, and left side strokes, they tend to result in just problems with language, but your higher level awareness is mostly there. And so Luke Thompson was talking about it in terms of um, the left hemisphere's failure to submit comfort comprehension to apprehension which is a kind of more immediate knowledge by presence um it's it touching mm -hmm. the truth it's 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 feeling it's a kind of interiority that doesn't need to verbalize but it's like you know someone said you're always wisest the moment before you try to put it all in words and you always see most clearly the moment right before you try and put it into a language so it's that and 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 what that kind of recognizes is that the phenomenon in question is always more complicated then can be put into words and can be expressed via propositional logic. Um, and, um, and so the left hemisphere, it has a kind of, oh, shall we say, um, Faustian delusion that it can, it can put reality into a, into a neat little box and then identify with it. It's the deductive and, half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, 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 um, equating a partial truth with the whole truth 
and that's making a kind of grave and satanic error. And um, um, so, you know, McGilchrist is, is, is wise to notice that there is a kind of lack of touch with reality that, that, that um, right hemisphere disorder patients have, right hemisphere CBA patients have, um, that you don't see in those with a left hemisphere insult which suggests somehow that the right hemisphere is in a deep way, it's the master because it recognizes that, that in this element that we all find ourselves submerged in, to say anything definitive is to write on water. Um, it's, the statement is erased in the very act of being written down because to, to, to observe the phenomenon is to change it and to know the predict, to, to predict the future is to, to alter it. I feel like that even gets at what we were talking about earlier, at least to a degree of, um, yeah, of just kind of sacrificing logic and stuff. <clears throat> Where I would think I would say the, uh, was the less, the left hemisphere was like you said, was Faustian and almost satanic. Is that it seems to me that that side is necessary for relationship um, is because it is reductionist and it almost kills things and destroys things like we said because it's taking this higher uh, almost like eternal idea and trying to put it in a box basically put it in a frame it in words like you're trying to create words but you have to do that in order to hand it to someone else or something or you have to do that in order to even for your own sake to understand it because like like when you're trying to to get at this high idea like i've experienced that it almost seems like it's like up there and i just want i got to pull it down to almost put it in a frame for my own my own sake to understand it and i feel like we do that with god which is in all these little ways kind of making him into little idols like mitch was saying earlier we're kind of he brought up the fact that we're all kind of almost a heretic to some degree if god is actually yeah, infinite sure. then like we have to but you have to make him finite to some amount in order to understand him because it's like, well, you, he's he, made himself he, funny. Yeah. Like he can't be named. He says, right. Like I am like, what is your name? I am. And it's like, I am like, he's, he's, he's above all names, but then he gives you names. Like, so that way you can say, well, so that way you can have some sort of relationship or something. So I know this name of God, I know this name of God, but it's like, he's not just that name. If you reduce him to just that name, then you've made an idol and you made yourself a heretic almost or something like, and you've, uh yeah you've gone off course it's kind of like i like the imagery you said of like riding on water it's like yeah and then about the scripture like it's kind of is the same way it kind of destroys your category you get it and then you write it down and then it's like you keep reading and it's just like oh there goes my logic again or something i don't know how to describe it right but well i think but, you're kind of asking a wise question when you're asking basically in what sense is idolatry perhaps necessary and you know the question you know that McGilchrist has to answer if the right hemisphere is so superior in, in almost every respect, why does the left hemisphere exist? And maybe because it is optimizing for one value to the exclusion of all others, because it's sacrificing everything for mastery and accuracy in one tiny and narrow area, um, it is able to to specialize and to be dexterous because interestingly the master hemisphere controls the non-dominant hand why because it doesn't have much control over that hand the left hemisphere is better at using its hand and the left hemisphere is the hemisphere that speaks for you even if it is not it does not exhaust one's uh uh, receptive and expressive language it's the one that speaks for you because why it's the one that actually can control your mouth and face um satisfactorily because that's not easy you know that that takes people to execute that takes detail-minded people so to speak to 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 um you know like jordan peterson talks about you want you want creative people to start corporations and you want conscientious people to run them so left hemisphere, because it's focused on detail, it's irreplaceable um, as far as as far as executing. 
um, at bearing down and closing in. Um, uh, but <clears throat> it, when it confuses itself, when it takes itself to be the master, then that's that's when problems begin for for Mick Gilchrist. So it's it's I mean it's a very interesting paradigm. He's a tremendously interesting guy, tremendously wise. I think he understands more about the unity of opposites, you know, than well than I do for whatever that's worth. But I mean, than you know most most people do. So like you know, it's it's pretty awesome. It sort of checks with Craig's uh, original, I think. Um, issue uh which is well and i i wouldn't say it in the same way the cow did about uh the, that you have to select sort of a, an idolatry ah i don't i'm, I'm misgoing but never mind uh that idolatry is necessary that, yeah that's kind yeah, of what I, I was getting at well it's what jason what you're saying is that the lord has revealed uh, a number of ways in which we can uh, address him or view him. And, and I think Craig was kind of suggesting that we have a number of ways. And I would say the Lord has given us a number of ways with which to view reality and with a number of lenses with which to view his word. And, uh, and yeah, maybe if, if you make a particular one, the, the master, then you You've gotten into to danger uh, of idolatry, uh, but I, I think part of the big question that we had to to move into after that was: is, is there a system for when to use which lens, or a unified system for when to use which lens where, or, or when to maybe emphasize which aspect well, of God or, or which name of God? Well, when you think about it, the right hemisphere is the master because it acknowledges that it is it is not the master. Like similar to how Christ attained divinity by let by being the one willing to let it go and go to his death. And so, in other words, the right hemisphere is like Socrates. All I know is that I know nothing. And in that way, it's more in touch with reality. Um, but at, like to answer McGilchrist's question, and then maybe begin to answer Mitch's question of like, you know, why, why are there two hemispheres like this? I would say that, you know. Uh, in God, we live and move and have our being. God is the infinite. The infinite is not infinite simpliciter <clears throat> or simply speaking. The infinite is an interplay between the infinite and the finite. And that's what you have going on. You have, you have, the, you have the variable and the value. You have the formless and the form, you know, or you have the form and you have the, the parts. And, um, you know, you have the right hemisphere and you have the left. And um, it's their interplay and their dialogue that creates reality on some level. Now, Mitch, again, what was your question? You were asking when, yeah, it's like when, when to hold them and when to fold them. Yeah, sometimes when to use which left, lens where. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. sometimes turn left, sometimes right, sometimes toward order, sometimes toward freedom, which way. Uh, and that's, that's why McGilchrist has that beautiful image from William Blake of Urizen. He's writing with his left and right hand in two separate directions like da Vinci um, is an image of the, the infinite or the, the ancient of days. Um, but no, I don't, I don't even know, like, cause that's, 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 if I knew then I would be president or something. Um, I think, I think when it comes to lenses and when to use which one where, I would think, um, I think what maybe helps me is like, like kind of like Cal's talking about, if I just have an awareness of which lens I'm using, then I can kind of almost properly take take a like pop, properly combine them both or something. Because like I guess one one thing I like because Craig mentioned a long time ago in our conversation, like some people have a very very focused like point of view, right? So they're very very attentive to detail, and then but then they miss this broader picture, right? And so there's like but that is so I, I should just be aware of when I'm seeing like that because there's great utility for seeing that like that because I can pick up on detail. But then, but then like I need to be aware that I'm missing this broader picture and like there's all this other stuff like that I still need to include somehow. But then if I'm only taking this broader picture, I've ex it seems like this can happen. Like when you experience, if you're just taking a broader picture and you keep stepping back and keep stepping back, um, you lose... Gosh, you lose something. Uh, 
this is why I think it's really related to the story of Christ and God becoming man because it's um, an incarnation. Um, what did, what Emmanuel, like that's the word, God, God with us, because it's like, if God gets too lofty, <clears throat> he, you lose all morality at some point. And then if it gets too particular, you lose morality at another level or something like things just, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Right. It's just well, like the only way I know it's from like, almost like from experience. Like if I look at, if I take this lofty God position then people are just little insignificant stories in the character, they're just insects. And you can like, this one's expendable because we're looking at the greater story, the broader picture, like then all the finite details are almost like, I can just toss them around willy nilly because like, oh, this person, I can sacrifice this person for this greater good. And it's like, no, you have to combine, like you have to come back to reality, like Emmanuel and get and like combine the very particular. But then if you go too far down and get too particular, things just start to disintegrate for some reason. Um, and well, this you, lose, is... you lose the greater story or something. And it has to have a combination of both. Sorry. Hi, Rudy. <laughs> Almost done. Yeah. Almost done. Yeah, we've been going for a long time. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Your dinner's yeah, getting I, cold. I, I, I well, I guess you don't need it. You need it to have just you, the maybe the mature reader really understands that he needed just use one lens, uh, <laughs> but he could use several lenses to to gain or to glean from the, the same part of this book. It, however, and it's where I stay really kooky. Uh, I do think that a person that's operating with just one lens who's, a, who's approaching this book prayerfully and in Christian community can, can really succeed. Uh, but it, I don't have any proposition and basis. For what I guess. The question. <clears throat> the, the question, I, I think the way I would put it, it's not about when to deploy. I wouldn't say lens. I mean, it, we've used the words comprehension and apprehension that are akin to the two types of the two hemispheres. And I'd call the I, earlier I called them the deductive one is lateral association and the the um, let's say the apprehend apprehensive one is it's the wrong word is the the vertical association and i don't i don't know that the, the question i'm interested i like this seems the question to me is not when to deploy which one but should we expect that the the bible is intelligible in the deductive type of way in the propositional way is it is it is it always because it seems to be you could call that you could call that logic is it logically consistent? We use the word aesthetically consistent. I think aesthetically coherent, meaning in the pattern recognition sense, but I don't, Yeah. it seems like we're in a predicament if it's not, if it's not logically consistent because it, it, it almost suggests we should stop, we should stop that business of trying to understand it deductively, which we seem to do a lot of. I don't know that it is intelligible in that way. And if it's not, maybe we should be playing a different game. I would be pretty hesitant to toss it out altogether. Uh, why does it have to be one or the other? Right? It, I don't know that it does, but if you're gonna, if we, if we agree that it's at least not completely propositionally intelligible. If it's not completely, then it's partially. And if it's partially, then we need a scheme that tells you when to deploy your propositional uh, lens. I think you need that literal grammatical, or excuse me, the grammatical historical method where you're trying to define the author's intent and situate him in this historical context. And you're trying to decode the ancient languages according to their grammar. Because otherwise you don't have any constraints, but you also shouldn't make the mistake of assuming that that method exhausts the meaning of scripture. It's going to be the both and, of both either or and, both and, of both linearity and laterality. Something like this is the 
is the desideratum, something like this is the goal. And um, um, uh, so I, you know, ideally, yeah, you would, you would have mastery over the ancient languages and you would, you know, get bust out your Bible commentary, I think, and um, uh, kind of look at, see what do these verses connect to in terms mm -hmm. of the author's intention or, and also what are just some very <clears throat> obvious parallels that people have always noted. Um, you know, but, but, um, like Jason says, I think Jason said, you know, you, you also assume that it has a personal dimension in the meeting you where you're at. And so now that's where the kind of maybe richness comes in. I don't know. I'm not really good at exegeting the Bible. That's, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I noticed certain verses kind of jumping out and slapping me at various times, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, like I've been, I've been like tangling with the book of revelation and just generally doing a horrible job. Like I haven't made any progress in understanding that book. Mm. Um, I, I don't think anybody's really good at ex ex like doing, what is the term exegeting the Bible? I think, I think yeah. we, uh, I think when we think we're good at it is when we just failed yeah. miserably. But you know, there's a pretty incredible history of, of people with like just no resources whatsoever but just being transformed uh when they read this book and in reaching that ultimate uh love the, the that that place through through reading this and being transformed by it and yes that's, that's true that is true they, nobody, the weird, nobody has no resources but the weird thing is like it's i think this is this back like the weird thing is you see other people do that that don't have the book too like where they'll reach like and they may not and like what i was this kind of gets at maybe what i was saying last night too is where we're judged on maybe knowledge or something like and what people are actually blind to and so they're not held accountable because there are people that reach like this higher <clears throat> level of love than most christians ever reach they're never even touching the bible and there's this i almost quoted it earlier i had to go look for it because uh i don't know if any of you if you guys know terry souls back she's like my parents she's kind of like almost like a second mom to me i grew up with i know terry she, yeah, she, she said this line and I just had to write it down because I was like, man, it's it's basically the gospel. But she's, she does a lot of gardening and she just said, the plant says, I get planted, I flower, I fruit, I go to seed, I die. And I was at, and I was just like, that's like, so it's like it's the, pa the pattern of love. Well, the one thing left out of there is that, I, that it resurrects, you know, but the pattern of love and the gospel is like just even on that level like we're talking about even like on a molecular level or bi biological level like it's this it just that's what's so astounding me about the book like if you just keep reading it and try to just humbly understand like what is this he was getting at you start to see its implications um just like this is the that's why i can't get away from it it's like even if i try to like like throw away my logic and desert my understanding and be like, I'm just going to approach this like I'm not a Christian or kind of desert traditional Christian beliefs and approach this book. It almost becomes more profound to me. And I'm just like, I can't get away from the story of Christ because of like, there it is in a freaking plant. Like what's so going here, on here? Here we have two poles in scripture, freedom and constraint. On the one hand, freedom and acts. It says, um, I guess Peter says of Cornelius. Now I see that that uh, God is not a respecter of per persons and everyone who does right and every nation is acceptable to him, um, to God. And, and um, on the other hand, you've got Paul who's saying, he says something like, um, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, but um, how can they call on the one of whom they have not heard, right? So you got, you got these two, got these two poles freedom and constraint one is like you don't need to know jesus the other is you do yeah and um that's i mean to me oh yeah i'm sorry guys i gotta split but i really oh, okay. see you guys uh, i'll keep listening all right okay i i gotta jump too but okay. cal i want i want to hear the rest of this thought well i don't think there was much left to it and just in, just in the sense that you know i have thoughts on what paul meant what he could have meant what's a way of reading paul but is that what he meant um if it's not what he meant is that necessarily a problem because are we assuming that what paul meant exhausts 
the meaning of, of what Paul meant or what, what Paul means. Mm. Um, you know, it, it just kind of goes like, kind of goes like that. I mean, to me, the, the weird thing is in a way that I can't explain, it makes perfect sense what Paul says, while at the same time, like, to me, it's like not at all a requirement that, say, Native Americans or Chinese people need to have heard Jesus in order to avoid the flames of eternal destruction. Um, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Jesus will meet them where they're at in the next life, and he will speak to them in their language. And with their, you know, sort of cultural assumptions, um, he will he will translate himself as, as the logos. Um, and to me, for some reason, I have no problem squaring this with what Paul says, but I don't really know how to explain why I don't have trouble with this. There's this other part where I think it's the sheep and the goats part you brought up in a recent thing too, Cal, where the people say, when did we see you? Like when did we did all these, and uh, I can't remember the exact words, but like these people do all these good deeds and basically kind of reflect, reflect God's nature. And they're like, well, when did, and, and Jesus says, you did all these things to me. And they're like, when did we see you? Like we never even, knew. and I think, I feel like it's kind of similar. And even with this plant thing, it's like, like the person that sees that, if they just are gardening and understand that through a plant and then somehow it could be like that's their encounter with christ is he meets them through the through the plant like i they're like man i need to reflect my life in the same pattern of this gardening it's like that's that's almost like christ speaking to him or something in that way okay. and now all right sure I, probably, I might hop off here too actually go get some food but so you're talking about is this pat the pattern of the infinite that jumps out at you everywhere is the pattern of the form giving way to formlessness which in turn uh begets greater richness of form yeah it's not so, like it's it's weird it's like the death is the precondition for more abundant life yeah it's like the disintegration the condition for a more fruitful uh for for, for a greater reintegration yeah uh-huh yeah, I think so. To me, that that it kind of gets at a lot of the stuff we've been going at recently too. Like even with um, how to how how to see Christ embodied in the world. Like that's kind of been a frustrating thing for me. Because I'm like, how am I actually supposed to see? Like, what is it about Christ that that makes him God? Like you mentioned before, and it's like I'm trying to think. And I don't know if I'm even getting at this right. Uh, it's like seeing that the the characteristics of God, the nature of God, the pattern of God, whatever, the pattern of love and fully embodied in a man. And it's like, but then you see it, like you see that's how reality actually works. Like that's how, that's how gardens grow. That's how like all this stuff happens. And so it's like, you can't, I can't really get away from the story of the gospel. Cause it's like, it's, it's everywhere. Like it's literally, in in the flower it's like this this pattern of of christ the flower grows and it it has to in in its glory is when it kind of has to seed and die and it 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 kind of becomes a martyr at that point so others other flowers can grow it gives it be in its in its most glorious state of identity of of reaching its its perfection you could say then it then it uh what does it do it dies it, it gives that it gives that up so and it's like it's it's i mean I'm, I'm sure i'm not describing it right but it's like this yeah the pattern of of christ of god of the nature of god is like in in all these little aspects of reality but yeah well, i mean I guess, I guess where it's not there is when things start to decay and die more i guess or something uh i don't i don't know the right way to say it like para in parasitical nature it's not there so we we don't see it in things like the things that are choosing for themselves it's like you see the you see the outcome of that and stuff is not the the pattern of life or whatever yeah, christology is hard to talk about i don't like to talk about it when i haven't had much uh when i don't have much gas in the tank so to speak yeah. and you know and typically the um the orthodox uh, kind of 
the solution, you know, to the to the problem posed by this topic, um, you know, namely that it seems um, so. Uh, it, it it always it always seems uh, uh, perched on the you know precarious edge of exploding in in the contradiction. Um, they restrict orthodoxy restricts itself to um, certain questions and only answers certain questions. And you know speculatively, I can answer I think a broader range of questions, but like right now, I feel like restricting myself to it but maybe i don't know maybe in the submit in the spirit of dying to self and admitting ignorance i'll ask i'll ask what my question was that was prompted by what you said the prayer of saint patrick says you know christ before me christ, be christ behind me christ to my left christ to my right christ christ when i rise christ when i go down christ above me christ below me you see him everywhere and then that way he begins to take on despite himself the pattern of the formless one or the attributes of the invisible and omnipresent one. And yet it was, it was, Jesus was meant to be the concrete embodiment of that limitless or, or formless one. And now he's sort of disappearing into identification with, with Yahweh. Kind of like, um, uh, Elisha ben Abuya, he, he engages in the kind of mystical practice of hekelo meditation, of descent, really ascent, but they write descent, sort of like how in Job it says, bless God and die, but it really means curse God and die. For some reason, they're too pious to actually say they're ascending, so they write they're descending into the temples, which is this kind of collective mind space that's been accessed by a number of like various Kabbalistic meditators. And each time they go into it, they extract more and more of its features. Again, it's like a product of their collective consciousness somehow. Um, there's a number of constraints that are set up. It's like here are the palaces of God. And then that kind of gives people the ferment or the seed, you know, to realize what they, what kind of images should be coming to mind. And, propositionally intellectually you know what they should be thinking about and then they go into it and they imagine it more and more richly but sort of at that edge where it's the subconscious kind of creating it and maybe not even it's not even internal it's it's a it's a genuine sort of interplay with ex, with an external reality you might say um and so elisha ben Abuya goes into the the throne room of god where it's like there's not supposed to be any up or down um or maybe he experiences it he experiences it without direction uh, even though he's been told it's not supposed to have any up or down or sense of internal orientation so in other words there's there are, he's he's entering into this mind space with the understanding that there are certain constraints and he discovers to his surprise that that the space is behaving differently and the throne room which is supposed to be empty because there's no one sits on the mercy seat god doesn't have a butt you know it's like it's a metaphor he sees someone sitting on the on the mercy seat and they call it the angel metatron it's a youth sitting where it should be the ancient of days um you know who's only a metaphor you know and so what is this and in elisha ben abuya he is he is anathematized for reporting back on this they said three went into the the throne room of god one went mad one became a heretic and asher is a, a, an other he's thoroughly othered he's he's made anathema elisha ben abuya and the only one to sort of to to enter the throne room and and um uh what I almost want to say, see God's face and live for it. But he he descended into into the temples in the Hekelo and returned with his orthodoxy intact. The only one to do that was Rabbi Akiva. What is it about? I, I began with, with Jesus sort of disappearing into Yahweh, and I ended with Yahweh sort of becoming becoming a, a finite form. 
and neither of which should be possible. But it kind of gets into, I think, what I said, the whole thing was prompted by a beautiful picture by the incomparable William Blake again, um, where God um, is, is, it's God judging Adam, the ancient of days seated on the chariot, ancient Hebrew depiction from before, from back when you could actually depict Yahweh. Um, he's, he's judging Adam, his creation. And um, uh, there's a, there's a, Texas, a Texan writer, I can't remember his name, he said, the meaning of this image is that Adam is God having displaced himself from himself. And that was where I got the idea of it, that, you know, just as when God looks at you, he sees himself. So when we look at God, we see a reflection of our true self. And the image of God consists, consists in an interdependence between creator and creature and father and son. It's something there in the interplay, again, between the infinite and the finite, uh, where in reality is body. So there's a, the, the tendency, I guess, you know, that's the best sense I can make of it. But I love I love the story of Elisha ben Abuya. It's kind of Jewish binitarian, binitarian heresy. I mean, Christians, you know, the personal Jesus disappearing into impersonal everywhere, um, every when, um, uh, taking on the attributes of the formless one, uh, the omnipresent, the unlocalized, the unimageable. Um, you know, it's it's um, you know, that's that's what came into my mind. Uh, uh, and now I now I can't cast. Well, I'm like Elisha Benabuya. Maybe I don't know. I mean, I'm you know, just just spitballing here. I'm spitballing at the almond tree. It's a safe space for heresy. Yeah, it definitely is for sure. I've been calling myself a heretic in this conversation. Yeah, I did. I mean, I think you're. Right yeah, because your Christology sucks, bro. <laughs> Bro, yeah, bro, I'm bringing you up to the council. We're we're breaking out the greenwood. Where's that? You know, oh, you're what, taking me out of the greenwood. Is that what you said? We're 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 breaking out the greenwood. Yeah, we're gonna burn you over it. <laughs> it's, it's, it burns slower. That's why we. That's why we choose greenwood. <laughs> yeah, Never heard that before. I mean, we're. I mean, this is what we kind thought of, it, for some reason it's not about mind. giving you another chance or like giving you an ESV study Bible. <laughs> but then we checked the number of times that we forgave you and we realized it's exactly 70 times seven. So you're out. You've got yeah. no more chances. So that's that's it. <laughs> then what you were saying reminded me of this verse in Job for some reason, like the finite and the infinite and playing and kind of getting out what we were talking about too. There's like this interplay between them and it seems to be this like like a pattern, like a secular pattern or something. But it says, Job is talking to God and he says, your hands have made me and fashioned me in intricate unity, yet you would destroy me. Remember, I pray that you have made me like clay and will you turn me to dust again? I don't know why, maybe that doesn't map on, but it kind of, for some reason, it reminded me of kind of what you were saying. Like there's this, your hands have made me and formed me into this finite thing, yet then you're, it's almost like, then the infinite's going to destroy it. That way, it could become it more in, infinite. Just, yeah. just like in Jeremiah, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to unmake that pot. Yeah, that you can make it. Yeah, yeah but yeah. um, uh, you know, it's. I mean, it's it's a it's a heavy word. You can hear it because all of it means that you 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 can't you can't just you can't just be justified. You know. Um, by the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ and get raptured before the tribulation starts. So you have to follow him. You have to go up to Cal, you know, Calvary with him. Yeah. There's no two ways around that. Yeah. Um, That's good. But, you know, you make, you, you worship a God of power. Why? Because you imagine then that you will be spared the punishment for sin, not seeing that the punishment for sin is what saves you from sin, which is what you should really be worried about, but you want to use the gospel as an excuse to just sin forever. Uh, and then, you know, it's because it's one and done, punctilious salvation, once saved, always saved. I prayed that Jesus, I prayed the, the sinner's prayer. And, um, you know, that's what it becomes when it, when it degenerates. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's that kind of lowest level of the faith is also, is this necessary foundation in terminalization 
Chris Langan is always speaking of nucleation, things putting down roots and being touching, executing at the level of bare, of bare metal. Um, and, you know, there's it's just, um, it's a grammatical expression. Reality conforms to a grammatical expression. And your, your I's have to be dotted and your T's have to be crossed in addition to your paragraphs flowing one into the next. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I like that. I am. Well, I might have to hop off here too. I haven't even, I'm going to go get some dinner. My sister okay. texted me about like probably an hour and a half ago and said she brought me over some food. And I haven't. Okay, I'll send, <laughs> you, a, I'll send you, I'll send you my, my Zondervan NIV study Bible all so right. you can get some gospel. All right, all right. Sounds I, good. Yeah. I hope I mean, it's got your notes in it too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, you just need to understand, you, you know, you just, you just need to, you know, believe, you just need to believe what the Bible says, basically, that's the problem. <laughs> I know, but I'll tell you, you know, you know, you, you are sinful, you are totally depraved, but Christ died for you, and you can, you can accept his sacrifice today, you don't have to keep being a heretic, <laughs> okay? okay. So I, right. I don't know if you heard I'll that. I'll think about so it. I just I'll needed think... you to know. Oh, all right, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll consider it. Maybe, maybe when I get your Bible in the mail, it'll, it'll lead me to the truth. Yeah, that's a joke. I shouldn't. Even make <laughs> no, I know. I know you're joking. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. All right, man. Well, thanks for hopping on here. It's great to see you. So. Okay, I'll catch you later. All right, love you, man. See ya. Love you too. Peace.